Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion number 4627 in the name of Kenny McCaskill on drink driving. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request speak button now. And I call on Kenny McCaskill to speak to me with the motion. Cabinet Secretary, you've got 14 minutes. Officer, today's debate on drink driving is timely, as we are entering the final phase of our drink driving consultation, which closes on 29 November. And as members will know, our consultation seeks views and our proposals to reduce the drink drive limit in Scotland. The current drink drive limit has been in force since the mid-1960s. And while social attitudes toward drink drivers have hardened over the years, it is tragic that latest figures show an estimated 30 lives continue to be lost each year on Scotland's roads as a result of drink driving. The consequences of drink driving can be tragic. The impact of drink driving accidents can shatter families and communities, and we must take action to reduce the risk on our roads. Last week, the reported Road Casualties Scotland 2011 report was published. Some key findings were 750 casualties were estimated to be due to drink drive accidents in Scotland in 2010. Around 20 deaths were estimated to be due to drink drive accidents in Scotland in 2010. Similar proportionality to GB as a whole. Uh, this is a fall on 2009, but the average for the last five years remains at 30 deaths. Casualties resulting from drink drive accidents have fallen by 35% since 2000, uh, from some 1,150 in 2000 to 750 in 2010, but we are still too high. In 2011, 3.4% of drivers involved in injury from accidents who were asked for a breath test registered a positive reading or refused to take the test. Mm -hmm. Presiding officer, while we welcome any reduction in the number of casualties, I still find these figures unacceptably high. In particular, mm -hmm. the number of deaths on our roads is far too high. For the past five years, there have been each year, on average, 30 families who have to contend with and cope with the loss of a loved one due to someone who thought it was acceptable to have a drink and then get behind the wheel and drive. Despite repeated warnings, some people are still intent on getting behind the wheel of a vehicle while under the influence of alcohol. It is reckless, it is totally unacceptable, and it is putting lives at risk. The people of Scotland are fed up of drink drivers and their poor excuses. It is both remarkable and tragic that a significant minority of drivers still ignore the warnings. Drivers are repeatedly told of the consequences of drink driving and drug driving through the summer and festive campaigns. These campaigns make clear that drink drivers and drug drivers will be met with the full force of the law. They will lose their license. They can have their vehicle seized and crushed. They can incur a fine, and they could face a lengthy prison sentence. However, we still see hundreds of accidents each year and carnage taking place on our roads as a result of the selfish actions of drivers who get behind the wheel significantly impaired, pose a severe risk to themselves other motorists and pedestrians. The question has to be asked whether the current drink drive limit is providing a sufficiently clear message that drinking and driving is unacceptable. We believe the current limit has had its day. The time is right for a change that will bring Scotland in line with the vast majority of Europe. If we look at the drink driving limits across Europe, our consultation paper confirms that it's only the UK and Malta that have a legal blood alcohol concentration limit of 80 milligrams of alcohol in every 100 millilitres of blood. 
Our European neighbours have not lowered the drink driving limit on a whim. They have taken this action to address problems with drink drivers on their roads. We have long called for a reduction in the drink drive limit and would like to follow in their footsteps. The day after we launched our consultation, the British Medical Association welcomed our proposals. We believe that we should listen to those who deal with the horrific effects of drink driving. Dr George Fernie, a member of the BME's Scottish Council and a police surgeon, said, and I quote, The BME has been lobbying for a reduction in the drink driving limit for some time, and with the devolution of this power to the Scottish Parliament, we are pleased to see some progress on this important issue. We believe that such a move will help prevent deaths and reduce the number of lives ruined by drink driving. A reduction in the limit would be in agreement with the best available evidence on the effects of alcohol on driving. Close quotes. Our consultation shows we are making early and effective use of the power devolved by the Scotland Act to reduce the drink driving limit. We welcome having the power to set the drink drive limit, but the Scotland Act was, we believe, a missed opportunity. The very limited transfer of powers on drink driving did not go far enough. We wanted a package of powers to be devolved that would allow us to consider whether the police should be able to carry out breath-testing drivers anytime, anywhere. We also called for powers to consider differential drink driving limits, for example, for young and novice drivers. And we also sought powers to consider changing the penalties for drink driving. None of these crucial powers were devolved by the UK government. By all means. Please, I, I am grateful to him for taking the intervention and I acknowledge the points he makes. Will he confirm today that the government has no intention of delaying legislation in this area pending uh, further discussions on the devolution of further power? Absolutely. Uh, we are pressing on as expeditiously as we can. I do recall that we have called as a government and as a party of government, we called for this when it was others who were in power in this chamber. Uh, the powers were not devolved then and the uh, support was not given to us by the administration at that time. But having now got it, uh, we are not going to look a gift horse in the mouth and we will proceed as quickly as we can to implement the change in the drink driving position. This will be dealt with not by primary but by subordinate legislation. And the only matter is a matter I have commented on publicly. There are some technical challenges that face the police in terms of dealing with the recalibration of the equipment. Uh, that is natural. It is a consequence of varying the limit. Uh, but we will work with the police. They are on the case. And as soon as that is done and the legislation is passed, we will implement it. But we do think that there is a missed opportunity, and perhaps it would be remiss of me not to comment as well, Mr MacDonald, since you asked the question that I did get a letter from you yesterday regarding rehabilitation matters, which too, I must say, are reserved to the United Kingdom. And if you want to join with me in asking them for to devolve those powers as well, I'll be happy to add that to the list of outstanding matters that we think would be better dealt with by these chambers. By all means. Um, with the interests of my many English friends and uh, relatives uh, at the heart of my question, um, is there any indication that south of the border they're looking for us to try this out and if successful as we, I think, believe it shall be, uh, to follow us so that uh, the UK can benefit from our pioneering? made uh, some time back that if they weren't prepared uh, to devolve the powers, we would be happy to do a pilot. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there has been no change in the perspective. That may uh, not be the case, but certainly my understanding is, as I say, that that is the situation there. What I can confirm to, to Mr Stevenson is I do know that the Association of Chief Police Officers south of the border uh, firmly support this, uh, so there are continue, uh, significant sections of society down there who would welcome it. Earlier this month, I wrote to Patrick McLaughlin, MP, 
UK Secretary of State for Transport to ask for the transfer of further powers on drink driving to be considered. The drink driving limit is important, but must be seen as only one part of efforts to tackle drink driving. We are in the midst of a consultation, and while the full results will not be known until after the end date and the responses have been analysed, it may be helpful to provide a flavour of some of the key issues emerging. Many people who have responded to the consultation agree that the Scottish Government should be handed more powers to tackle drink driving. Also, by all means, Richard Simpson. Uh, whether the Scottish Government, in fact, uh, made that submission to the committee that was considering the Scotland Act, whether you made detailed submissions about the reference of those particular powers to which you are now referring. I can't remember the precise details, but I have been writing to the UK Government for some considerable time, and when these matters were first raised, we have asked for increased powers. So whether it went to the committee, I, I cannot say, but I can say that the UK Government, and I would hope from that, others would have been under no, uh, no illusion as to what is being sought. Because although many consider that effective, well-thought-through marketing campaigns are critical to accompany a lower driving limit, there are other actions that are necessary. We do acknowledge the concerns of some that a lower drink driving limit might have a potential impact on trade for pubs and restaurants, and we can understand that, especially in the current economic climate, some businesses may have concerns. However, I know that pubs or restaurants would not want to have their customers place themselves or other road users at risk, and if people act responsibly by, for example, nominating a designated driver, I am confident that there should not be widespread impact on pubs and restaurants. So we are trying to achieve a behavioural change so that people do not contemplate drinking and driving. Scotland has an uneasy and unbalanced relationship with alcohol, and when people drink and drive, it can be a lethal concoction. Our central message has and always will be, don't drink and drive. The risks of drink driving should not be underestimated. Evidence shows that you are six times more likely to die with a blood alcohol concentration between 50 and 80. Although any level of alcohol can impair driving and people can react differently to alcohol, evidence shows that it's around 50 milligrams per 100 millilitres when impairment in driving manifests itself through a much increased likelihood of being involved in accidents. The BMA has highlighted that a driver with a reading of 80 in 100 was 10 times higher than, uh, than drivers with a zero blood alcohol reading in terms of road traffic crashes. The relative crash risk for drivers with a reading of 50, by all means. Jenny Mara. Sir, the Minister agree with me that the more police officers who are in offices doing backroom duties, the less there will be on the streets, on the streets uh, to detect uh, drink driving. Well, I do recall that uh, the Association of Chief Police Officers, what was commented on was that they were condemnatory of the coalition government cuts of approximately 18,000 officers, uh, but there was uh, faint support for Labour, uh, who said that they uh, condemned the coalition for cutting 18,000 officers. They would simply have cut them and would cut them by 10,000 officers. I think at the end of the day, we need to support a visible law enforcement process. It is estimated between 3 and 17 Scottish lives could be phased, saved, and that's why we comment on this. The UK Government Crime and Courts Bill introduced earlier this year contains provision that will create a new drug driving offence, and clearly that is reserved, but we will seek to work with them to deal with that particular aspect that is tangential but somewhat separate, but we would wish the powers, but in the absence of the powers, we will work with them to make sure that we are able to address that specific matter. Presiding officer, members will be aware this is a complex area, and that's why the panel that's addressing this matter comprises of academic and scientific experts dealing with alcohol and drug use. It will be reporting shortly, and we will seek to work with all partners and agencies. Scotland has a continuing problem with drink driving, and it is a problem we're determined to address. Drink driving remains a constant hindrance in our efforts to make Scotland's roads and communities safer and continues to be the cause of far too many accidents, injuries and deaths on our road. One life lost is one too many. We have a duty to those who have lost their life as a result of the mindless actions of those who drink and drive. We must tackle the scourge of drink driving head on and I hope that members will support our efforts to win the battle against drink drivers and support our proposal in our consultation to reduce the drink driving limit, I move the motion in my name.
I now call on Louise MacDonald to speak to you and move Amendment No. S4M 04627.2. And could I just say at this juncture in the debate, we have a bit of time in hand. And for those members who are willing to take a, a main, a, interventions, we will compensate you for your time. Louise MacDonald. Thank you very much, Signing Officer. Let me start with the central issue of the limits on blood alcohol concentration for drivers. We believe, as ministers do, that there is a strong case for early legislation. It was Labour at Westminster who commissioned Sir Peter North to consider the case for change across Britain, and the decision of the current Westminster Government to reject his recommendations is the reason we are having this debate in this Parliament today. <clears throat> it was in the context of that decision that Labour welcomed the devolution of powers to alter the drink driving limit under the Scotland Act earlier this year. We believe that this is, and Stuart Stevenson uh, I hope will agree, this is an area uh, where Scotland can give a lead, just as we did on smoking in public places, and that is a lead which a future UK government might well follow. That is why we also welcomed the Scottish Government's decision to consult on a re reduced limit of 50 milligrams per 100 millilitres of blood. At the same time, we believe that ministers need to address the resource implications of the changes they propose and that they should also treat their own consultation process with the respect it deserves. The first priority for the Scottish Government should be to take forward change on the basis of the powers that it has, uh, rather than making the arguments around the powers that it would like. When Parliament debated the Carloway report a few weeks ago, we made the point, of course, to see whether he is opposed to all of those powers being devolved or just some of them. Ms MacDonald? Well, no, I'm not in principle opposed to the devolution of powers in this area. What I am concerned with is to see the legislation come forward using the powers that are devolved already uh, and in order for that to then provide the basis for uh, where we go uh, going forward. And breath, uh, random testing, for example, was one of the North's recommendations. I think uh, he was able to elucidate strong evidence for that. I think some of the other issues raised by the Cabinet Secretary are less firmly evidence-based, but I don't think uh, the priority at this stage is the debate around those powers. The priority is to ensure that the powers we have can be implemented effectively. And when we debated Carloway a few weeks ago, I made the point that you could not realistically debate law reform without also considering uh, the practical context in which the justice system operates. And the same is true of changes in the law which widen the scope of offences or increase the powers and duties of the police. That is why our amendment highlights the link between limits and penalties for drink driving on the one hand and the practical capacity of the justice system to deal with increased numbers of cases on the other. We believe that changes in the law and resourcing of the justice system need to be considered together. Jenny Mara has already raised the concern, very widespread concern, about the risk of police officers being withdrawn from the front line because of staff job losses within the service, which we know are already happening. Nearly a thousand jobs have already gone. And it was ACPOS who raised concerns last year that a total... Of course. Cabinet Secretary. Cooper was prepared to say that she would reduce the number south of the border by 10,000. Is Mr Macdonald, given the position he's taking, prepared to say how many police officers he thinks Labour would reduce in Scotland? Bruce Macdonald. I, I, I find it bizarre that the Cabinet Minister responsible for the justice system in Scotland wants only to debate the justice system yep. in another jurisdiction. Yep. That, to me, seems a very weak defence of his position, because his position is to defend a, a number of police officers with no regard to the jobs those police officers actually do. And the evidence that is already there yep. demonstrates that many of those police officers, of which Mr McCaskill is so proud to boast, are actually now doing civilian jobs. Indeed, it was the Cabinet Secretary who told Parliament during the passage of the Police and Fire Reform Bill that he supported a decision in Lothian and Borders to replace civilian custody officers with police officers in that civilian role. So that's why his interventions are not acceptable and are not to the point. We know the jobs that are already going. Indeed, the, uh, uh, chief, the new Chief Constable, Stephen House, spoke to the uh, Justice Committee only last week I think one of the ministers is making an intervention from a secondary position. I'd be very happy to take Rosanna Cunningham if she has something uh, to say as part of this debate. Could the gentleman indicate what this has to do with the drink driving limits? Certainly, and uh, I, I'm sure, I'm sure you, your, your uh, semaphore to the presiding officer will not be necessary because, of course, our amendment is on the order paper and states very clearly that, uh, that, that, that we regard 
the improvement or the strengthening of the scope of offences uh, and, and uh, the role of the, and duties of the police as intrinsically linked across the board. You cannot make changes to the law without ensuring the justice system is fit to deliver those changes. I am not aware that the police view that random testing is an integral part of enforcing the law, that whilst they welcome the reduction in the limit, they do think it should be tied in, as you mentioned with the Northmen. Will you now give an assurance that you support that proposal and would welcome those powers being devolved? Well, I would ask the Cabinet Secretary, as the Minister in charge of the justice system, can he give us a guarantee today that police officers will not be withdrawn from carrying out frontline tasks of this type in order to cover jobs currently done by civilian staff? And we know it's not just about the police service. There are also jobs for the, uh, issues for the justice system more widely. We know from our constituents that Scotland's courts already face delays with churn holding up trials for weeks at a time, an unacceptable state of affairs for victims and witnesses. The proposed court closures across Scotland, budget cuts at the Scottish Court Service, falling numbers, of fiscal, numbers in the fiscal service, they must all have implications for any measures which will increase the number of cases brought to court. I'm sorry Rosanna Cunningham clearly does not understand that, but the proposals around drink driving law must be considered in the context uh, of the resourcing of the justice system. The Scottish Government's consultation on drink driving still has some week to go. It may well produce new evidence or fresh perspectives on the issue. It will undoubtedly highlight some of the practical issues that are bound to arise. And a fully informed debate on this issue cannot happen until that consultation closes and the Government publishes its response. And in matters of this kind, public opinion is important. The vast majority of drivers, and I heard and, and, and agreed with much of what Kenny, Kenny McCaskill had to say in this matter, but the, the vast majority of drivers do recognise that driving under the influence of alcohol is antisocial, it's a potentially lethal thing to do. Only a small number of people recklessly set out to disregard the law. But many drivers do so inadvertently, and the question of where the limits are set uh, and how uh, widely they are supported is central to this debate. The decision on that must be based on evidence, and like the original introduction of drink driving limits, it must be capable of effective enforcement and command the respect of the vast majority of drivers. The evidence, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, is that drivers are five times more likely to be involved in an accident with a blood alcohol concentration at the current level of 50 milligrams than with one at, uh, uh, of 80 milligrams. Uh, than with one of 50 milligrams, and that is the fundamental basis of the case for change. But it is important to acknowledge that there are other views, that there is an argument uh, that the level of accidents is reduced yet further uh, with a policy uh, of at or close to zero uh, tolerance, and that is not one uh, that either, I think, the government or uh, Labour will support. Nor indeed will the British Medical Association support that view. Uh, they highlight some of the respects in which uh, that could catch people who are not uh, in any sense uh, intentionally flouting the law, whether it be because of the alcohol content of mouthwash, whether it can be because of the consequences of medical conditions such as diabetes. There are very clear arguments uh, against a zero alcohol approach. And there are also legitimate concerns about enforcement in that area and how to ensure uh, that priority continues to be given to detecting and detaining drivers whose blood alcohol concentrations are particularly high. Those arguments around enforcement and around priorities are not, in my view, arguments for doing nothing, but they do emphasise the importance of an evidence-based and proportionate approach. And part of what makes for a proportionate approach is to measure our objectives against best practice elsewhere. As Kenny McCaskill said, countries in Europe and beyond have plumped for a 50 milligram limit as effective and enforceable. And for, so for Scotland to lead the UK in that direction is in line with international standards. And that in turn contributes to the need for changes uh, to command consent in the wider community. When drink driving limits were first introduced, there was broad support for change, even though it took time for that broad support to become universal. The evidence gathered for the North Inquiry showed that there is a public willingness to accept the introduction of a lower drink drive limit, even if there is not yet wholehearted support. It will be important to understand better where Scottish public opinion stands once the current consultation has closed. But my guess is that many drivers who would accept an effective limit of a single alcoholic drink 
as is proposed in the government's uh, consultation, would believe it was not proportionate to face the loss of a driving license, the loss of a vehicle, a fine, or even imprisonment for a blood alcohol concentration that would be legally safe in many other European countries. Uh, it is important that public sympathy should continue to be focused on the victims of irresponsible drink driving rather than on drivers banned on the margins of legal acceptability. I also recognise that reducing the limit in blood alcohol concentration will require not just resources for enforcement, but also uh, for driver education. The Cabinet Secretary very helpfully uh, raised uh, on, on my behalf the issue that I had written to him about regarding uh, drink driver rehabilitation schemes, such as that currently provided by Alcohol Support Limited in Aberdeen, but otherwise provided in Scotland uh, by private companies based elsewhere in Britain. These schemes offer offenders the opportunity to have their other penalties reduced if they undertake appropriate driver education. I think those are the kind of schemes that ministers should consider supporting more widely as part of the process of making tougher limits work. And I suspect that could be achieved uh, on the basis of executive rather than legislative devolution, and I hope that the Cabinet Secretary can come back at the end of the debate and tell us whether indeed he has explored or is willing to explore that possibility uh, with UK ministers. And we do welcome debate on what else should be done in this field, such as on random breath testing. But we do not believe that action in this area should be delayed any longer than necessary or pending any further devolution of powers. The powers exist to legislate and drink driving limits. We believe they should be used. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's confirmation that this legislation will not be delayed, and I look forward to that measure coming forward as soon as practicable after completion of the consultation process. And I move the amendment in my name. I now call on Alex Johnson to speak to and move Amendment S4M 04627.1. Mr Johnson, you've got seven minutes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And in case I forget to move the amendment at the end of this speech, let me take the opportunity to move it right at the beginning. It has to be said that over the past week or two, there have been a number of very heated debates in this chamber. And quite often, uh, we in our different political parties have sought to deliberately misunderstand and sometimes misrepresent the arguments that have been brought forward on our particular positions. However, I come to the Chamber today very specifically to talk about the issue of drinking and driving. And I, like the Minister, believe that this is a scourge in this country. In fact, I am of a generation that comfortably believes that it is wholly unacceptable to consume any alcohol if you have the intention of driving. And for that reason, I believe it's extremely important, significant and welcome that the Scottish Government are bringing forward a have brought forward a consultation and are now considering legislation in this area. But the particular point I want to raise is one that I will endeavour to ensure everyone in the Chamber understands so that they can that genuinely uh, recognise what it is the Conservatives would like to raise in this debate. Now, if we look at the performance of the police in recent years, there is, over the last 10 years, a clear indication that the number of cases of drinking and driving is falling. And that, I believe, is due to the hard work of our police forces and our justice system. And it's a demonstration that hard work can pay off. The annual Christmas campaigns to uh, discourage drink driving is something which I am genuinely supportive of, and the fact that numbers who are caught during these campaigns tend to rise and fall from one year to the next is, I believe, more likely to be an indication of commitment and effort by individual police forces at individual uh, Christmas periods rather than the indication of any trend. I believe that people, by and large, understand that what they are doing is inappropriate. The proposal to bring forward a reduction in the limit which we enforce is one which, as I say in my amendment, uh, I believe a case may exist. However, I do have concerns. The people who are drinking and driving and causing many of the accidents, injuries and deaths are people who are already two or three or five times over the legal limit as it stands today. I believe the onus falls, therefore, on the government to give a clear demonstration that those whose blood alcohol level lies between the proposed new limit and the current limit 
are the problem that they claim them to be. My concern... Uh, I will take an intervention before I resume. And this is an absolutely genuine inquiry mm -hmm. to which I do not know the answer. Um, you've just said it's the very high tariff drinkers that are responsible for most uh, of the, uh, the, the, the accidents. Can he point me at the evidence that he's actually drawing upon when he says that? Because I want to go and read it if it exists. Alex uh, Johnson. I am aware that there is statistical evidence that indicates that the risk does increase at levels below the current limit. But that, in, uh, if you will uh, bear with me for a moment, is not the point that I was trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is that the success of the police force to date in pursuing those who are well in excess of the current limit is something that we should praise. My concern is if that we reduce the limit, there may be a change in that focus. Now, just to give you an example, at the moment, I believe the right place for the police to be enforcing the law uh, is on our streets on a Friday or Saturday evening when those who have consumed large amounts of alcohol mistakenly get behind the wheel of a car uh, to the risk of the public. A lower limit may raise the spectre that the most productive place to enforce the drink driving limit might be in a supermarket car park on a Sunday morning where the hard-working mother who had one glass of wine too many uh, after she got the kids to bed on a Saturday night may still find herself slightly above that lower limit on the Sunday morning. Something which today uh, is a, a, a concern, but nonetheless the likelihood is that a change of focus in terms of productivity as catching drink drivers is concerned may result in those who currently exceed the limit excessively not being caught as they are today. Yes, I'll give way Dennis to Dennis Robertson. Uh, I thank Alex Johnson for taking the intervention. Uh, is Alex Johnson genuinely saying that if a person is above the limit, even if it's the day after having one glass too many, he's, uh, he's actually saying that's okay? Because I believe if you are impaired by alcohol um, and you've had one glass too many, you should not be behind the wheel, and certainly not if you've got children in the car. I, I agree uh, completely with that premise, and I believe I pointed out at the beginning of my speech that that was my concern. Uh, my concern here is to ensure that those who are responsible for enforcing this limit, through, uh, for this lower limit, do not change their focus to a different group, uh, therefore leaving those who are currently the problem in a, in a situation where they are less likely to be caught and less likely to be pursued. Yes, one last Maybe intervention. Mr. Mac MacDonald. Would the member not accept that anybody who is over the limit for drink driving is the problem? Alex Johnson. This is absolutely the case, and that's why we're discussing today where that limit should be and whether the changing of that limit might have uh, effects that are not the first things that come to your mind. I am genuinely concerned that there may be some unintended consequences and that if we are to move ahead with legislation which will change the limit at which we enforce drink driving levels in Scotland, that we do so in such a way that we ensure that we don't let some of these uh, current offenders off the hook. It's essential, uh, as is contained in the, the Labour Party amendment, to ensure that police resources and the resources within our courts are adequate to achieve this objective. If we are to change the drink driving limit, it may be assumed that additional resources would be required in order to cover the responsibilities which would fall to the police. It is my belief, as I said at the outset, that we should not be tolerating drinking and driving in Scotland today and that the limit should be set in such a way as to ensure that we save more lives and prevent more accidents. I think it's up to the, the government and the minister to ensure that he can demonstrate the impact of the drivers below the current limit is sufficient to spread that load and effort, and to ensure that police effort will not, as a result of this change, be refocused on a group that are less likely to cause accidents than the one that may be protected by this change. So I look forward to hearing the Minister's response on that, and I look forward to the part, my party's continued consideration of this proposal, which we do take seriously, uh, and will look forward to legislation being published. 
We now move to the open debate. Can I remind speakers that you have six minutes, but as already indicated, I am prepared to give additional time if you do take interventions. James Dornan, to be followed by Richard Simpson. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, can I just start off by, by uh, talking about the, the lowering of the limit? I know from, I'm going to say personal experience, but I don't mean through me, uh, I know of at least one person who has suffered justifiably because they had a couple of pints and their judgment was impaired and they lost their license and they nearly lost their job and they could have lost their house because their judgment was impaired after thinking that it was okay to go down to the pub, have a couple of pints, come back up the road and nothing would happen. I think there's a really strong case, the evidence seems to be here quite clearly, that we should be thinking about lowering the limit. Uh, funny enough, I'm going back to something pretty similar. I, I'm of an age that, uh, when I was young, drink driving was deemed to be acceptable. Never legal, but acceptable. I remember as a young boy in the late 50s and early 60s, people drinking at house parties, and then the extremely rare person who had a car back in those days, thinking nothing of driving it, despite the amount that they'd had to drink. Fast forward 10 and 15 years, and I shudder when I think of the number of times as a young man I got a run home from the pub or had been driven to a party by somebody who, looking back, was clearly over the limit. And sometimes not just a wee bit, but much more than that. Now, we all know that when you're young, you consider yourself immortal. Unfortunately, I can think of at least two young men in their early to mid-twenties, the prime of their lives, who found out this is not necessarily the case. Presiding officer, one in seven accidents on our roads are connected to drink or drug driving, and over a third of those involve young drivers. Clearly, we need to do all we can to protect these predominantly young men from risk to both themselves and harming others. And I go back to the point about the, you know, just having one argument. If you're not allowed, or if you're scared to have one because you can get pulled, and, that, and it takes you over the limit, then maybe you won't even start drinking, because I think a lot of the problems stem from you go in to meet your mates, you think you'll have one pint, you stay for three and four, you think that you can handle that, and then something happens and somebody suffers the consequences of it. But to go back to this, it's why I welcome the fact that the SQA have set up a qualification in conjunction with the DVLA called Safe Road User, which educates fifth and sixth years in responsibility and driving and fosters an understanding of not only when you're fit to drive, but also, more importantly, when you're unfit to drive. This has been taught by campus police in Glasgow, as well as across Scotland, to great effect. Part of the course encompasses discussion and debate around when the drink driving limit needs to be set at. This discussion really brings home the responsibility that we have a duty to not just keep ourselves out of harm's way, but to make sure we don't put others in harm's way either. Obviously, the more work we can do to target the most at-risk groups, and the young are certainly one of them, the better. If it's, if it's on drink driving, yes. <laughs> I thank the member for his comments about young people and about education. Does the member share my view that introducing a graduated driving licence where uh, young drivers get more experience before they have a full unrestricted licence like New Zealand is a good, is a good way forward? Well, there's a number of things that we can be looking at. I, I, I think we should concentrate on the drink driving here, try and get that out of the way and just look to see how we can improve the safety aspect of young drivers because it is a major issue. But you know, it wasn't and isn't just young men who take these chances nor was it only or even mainly the poor or the unemployed or the uneducated to take such risks. I know an eminently intelligent guy with a very respectable job and a lovely family who every night on his way back from work would go to his local club for two pints before heading home. Think about it. Every night he took the risk that he could be stopped by the police, lose his licence and probably his job just for the sake of a couple of pints. But of course he could handle it. Madness. Along with the highly successful campaigns and education programmes we've had over the years, we need the power of random stops. Both in the case just mentioned and the instances of the many young male drivers we talk of, we are convinced by our infamous macho culture that they can handle their drink. If they knew it was possible, and it's sometimes likely, that they could be pulled over to be tested, it would surely make them think again. This is why I support the Cabinet Secretary's letter to Patrick McLaughlin, Secretary of State for Transport, asking for this power, among others, to be introduced either by the UK Government or devolved to the Scottish Parliament. Presiding officer, any death due to drink driving is one too much, and it's clear that the per uh, permitted limit plays an important role. The Government's consultation proposal that, that it should be reduced to 50 uh, micrograms per 100 millilitres has been approved by almost every country in Europe, except for Malta and the UK, as, a, as the Cabinet Secretary says earlier. I believe that the Republic of Ireland have recently lowered theirs, and Northern Ireland would like to lower theirs too. And the BMA says that 
people are six times more likely to die with a blood alcohol concentration between 50 and 80 than if they have a zero blood level. What more do we need to support this reduction? You know, times have changed. There's more traffic on the roads. More people are driving now than they were 30 years ago with the decreasing age that drivers first get their licence. And traffic is generally faster with more hazards for drivers to negotiate. But there's no doubt that culture has also changed and changed for the better. Today, if you're out with your mates and refuse a drink because you're driving, there's a much more willing acceptance of this and you no longer face pressure just to have one. Can I just put in the record here, I don't drink. <laughs> I don't want people going away thinking, guys, I've never out of those pubs. Uh, we've also seen a drop in the number of drink driving offences, which across Scotland have dropped by more than a third between 2002-03 and 2011-12, and the number of fatalities caused by drink driving in the past 10 years has halved, with a similar number in the number, a drop in the number of serious injuries. But we're not there yet. People continue to drink and drive, and we continue to have fatalities and casualties caused by this. There are still too, still too many people being found behind the wheel having taken a drink, as the Cabinet Secretary said earlier on. So whilst there's been a sustained change for the better in attitude to drink driving, it is still a serious problem. We've already heard about the amount of deaths and serious accidents that take place every year in Scotland. And how we tackle drink driving needs to be multifaceted. Until such times as we have the legislative powers required, we must use all the methods at our disposal. Just finishing the proceedings. As mentioned earlier, this change needs to come through sustained education about what the drink, risks of drink driving are, along with, and maybe most importantly, a change in culture so that it is seen by society as taboo to have an alcoholic drink and then get behind the wheel. A zero level would be enforced not by the law, but by peers, families, friends and communities. When I think back to 30, 40 years ago, most people would not have thought twice about getting behind the wheel having had a few drinks. Today, the idea of me driving my sons, or even worse, my grandchildren, with even the smallest amount of alcohol in my bloodstream makes me shudder. As a parliament and as a government, we've made great strides to make Scotland a safer place, but we still have a bit to go. I welcome the Scottish Government's consultation, look forward to repatriating those powers we require to make us an even safer country whilst on the roads, and urge everyone across the chamber to put aside party differences take part in the consultation, welcome the Cabinet Secretary's request of Mr McLaughlin for action and support the motion. Thank you. I now call on Dr Simpson to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It is an uncomfortable fact that Scotland does have a difficult relationship with alcohol. Alcohol consumption per head in Scotland is amongst the highest in the world and 23 per cent higher than in England or Wales, and that's despite similar pricing and availability. The effects of harmful levels and patterns of consumption are seen every day on Scotland's streets, in our criminal justice system and in our NHS. And I hope at some point we'll have a debate, full debate, about the justice approach in general. But today we are clearly focusing on drink driving. Across the United Kingdom in 1979, there were 19,470 accidents, 1,640 deaths. By 2008, this had gone down to 8,640 accidents and 430 deaths a very welcome reduction following the introduction of the original policy by Barbara Castle in the 1960s. But the rate of reduction has flattened, and recently there's even a suggestion that it may be beginning to rise again. So it is time for us to refresh our, our attack on drink driving. Despite our high levels of consumption, our legal limit for driving under the influence of alcohol remains one of the highest in the world at 80 milligrams percent of alcohol. Reducing the legal limit to 50 milligrams would bring Scotland in line with the majority of European states, including German, Germany, France and Italy, and could possibly save as many as 17 of the 30 lives that are lost each year. Many countries similar to Scotland economically and demographically have established a 50 milligram limit as the, le legal, as the legal limit. Now, does it help? Well, we know that levels above 50 milligrams are associated with four times the rate of accidents, in answer to Alec Johnson's question, the rate does rise even more above 80, but the rate is four times as much above 50 as it is below 50 in terms of accidents, and that's the justification for the policy. The Centre for Public Health Excellence's 2010 study analysed 15 European countries and concluded that the adoption of a 50 milligram limit reduced alcohol-related driving deaths by about 11.5% amongst young people. In Australia, where drink driving is one of the main causes of road fatalities, lowering of the lim limit to 50 milligrams reduced fatal accidents generally, and specifically in the state of Queensland, produced an 18% reduction. The case of France illustrates that the implementation of blood alcohol limits can only be effective when coupled with publicity and visible enforcement of the laws. 
the French government cracked down on drink driving, replacing the previously relaxed attitude. Strict penalties and frequent roadside sobriety checks are commonplace in France. And the result, for example, in Sweden is that drink drivers always receive a form of custodial sentence. This is not new. Sixty years ago, when I was a child, we had a refrain in Perthshire. 30 days has September, April, June, and November. And I won't complete the, the phrase when we were learning our months and how long they were, but we added something at the end, and that was, and Sheriff Prane. Sheriff Prane, who was the subject of the children's rhyme, jailed everyone who was caught drink driving in Perthshire. And that did mean that people tended to drink less when they were in Perthshire. Right now, UK citizens are less likely than other European citizens to know what the legal limit is. Even if the limit was more widely known, the actual risk of being detected and sanctioned for drink driving is very low in the United Kingdom. France is now going even further. France has introduced a new law which makes it mandatory from this month to carry a breathalyzer kit in their vehicles. Now, this will have the effect of making the public even more aware of the law. So a change in threshold may not be enough. We need more publicity. We need a campaign not just at Christmas. We need proper enforcement uh, of the laws. Uh, and I hope that that will indeed occur. Introducing a new drink driving threshold without additional resources could seriously hamper any benefit. The benefits are not just in driving, but in changing, changing the culture. In France, they introduced not just the curtailment on drink driving and the enforcement of it, but also the loi Evian, which curtailed advertising. Now, the effect of all these measures together, and they didn't take any measures on price, interesting enough, but the effect of all those measures was to change the culture in France, resulting in a halving of the level of deaths from cirrhosis, from twice the EU average to the average. In the same time, Scotland has gone from the average to twice the average. So we need to uh, uh, make a change. The United States actually is still maintaining an 80 milligram limit. They have uh, decided in recent legislation to focus on programs to detect drinkers rather than lowering the limit. Interestingly, to prevent recidivism in the United States, some states require now the use of ignition interlock devices where a driver must blow into, blow into a breathalyzer in order to start their car. And as uh, some speakers have already said, People who actually re-offend are a problem. They do not take the lesson of that first license suspension or fine to, into effect. And I think we, need to we may need to deal with that in the, in the future. With a 50 milligram threshold, uh, will, it, will that achieve the correct balance? Well, setting a zero limit, and Lewis MacDonald referred to this, does occur in some countries, such as the Czech Republic and Hungary. But these are not easy to enforce. Uh, some alcohol from the night before, the ingestion of cough medicine, or even a mouthwash could put the driver over the limit. So this is not appropriate. We could do a 20 milligram limit, but I believe that a 50 milligram right is the right limit at present to refresh the policy uh, and to resume, hopefully, the downward trend. Some have suggested lowering the limit for new drivers. Yes, yes, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, is the member aware that the 20 milligram limit is already in UK law for aviation? I wasn't, and that's, uh, as always, an interesting fact from Stuart Stevenson. The, the 10 milligram limit has been implemented for those in the first three years of being licensed in some European countries. But I would point out that although accidents are very much higher in young drivers, the numbers associated with drink are actually lower in this age group. I think younger people have a better culture of this than people of my generation. So if we are to shift the culture, we'll need a continued and sustained and imaginative advertising and information campaign. I think general practitioners can play a part in my private member's bill, Shifting the Culture, suggests that if a drink driving offence is committed, uh, that the court should inform the GPs. I was never informed of any of my patients who'd committed that offence, not in 30 years of practice. And therefore, I didn't have the opportunity to actually take up with them the dangers of their reoffending. So in summary, I think that we are all agreed, and the, uh, as Mr. Dornan has called for, there is cross-party acceptance that we should now reduce the limit. Uh, but I do believe that the government will have to look at uh, providing the resources to enforce this in the same way as the, uh, as the Labour government did for the smoking ban. We gave extra money to ensure the initial enforcement. So I hope that uh, they will consider strongly uh, the uh, amendment in, in Lewis MacDonald's name, and I support the reduction to 50 milligrams.
Thank you very much. Now I call on Mark MacDonald to be followed by Dennis Robertson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. You know, I thought at the start of his speech that I was going to agree with everything that Alec Johnston said, and then it all went a bit wrong. Um, I, I, don't un I, I don't understand where Alec Johnson was going with his notion of unintended consequences. To me, if you are over the limit, you are over the limit, and therefore you need to be dealt with. Now, if Alec Johnson is suggesting that people will focus on soft targets, well, the, the notion is that people who are over the limit are by definition a problem and need to be dealt with. Whether or not they are only slightly over the limit or significantly over the limit, the point is that they are over the limit. And I, I was interested by the point he raised that um, his view was that the, the, the real problem were people who were significantly over the limit. And our National Institute for Clinical Excellence review in 2010 estimated with the proposed new limit of 50 milligrams that road fatalities would drop by 13.8 per cent and road injuries by 1.4 per cent within six years. So if it were the case that it were only the people who were currently significantly over the 80 milligram limit who were the significant problem, we would not see that kind of statistic, I would wager, from dropping the limit. But I'll happily allow Mr Johnson Alec to... Johnson. Uh, can I ask if that uh, analysis that he gave us a moment ago took into account the issue of resources and whether it accounted for the fact that resources, uh, if not increased, would therefore have to be spread more widely and consequently may not produce the results we were expected? Uh, MacDonald. Well, in, that's better. Uh, in the same way that uh, Alec Johnson was uh, reluctant in telling us exactly the background to his statistics, I'm quoting the statistics I have in front of me, which is what the results of the review were in relation to reducing the limit. Interestingly, um, as well, I, I come at this from my, my own personal perspective. Like, uh, like James Dornan, uh, I, I don't drink. I feel like it's some sort of inverse confessional in that respect. But, but I, did, I did used to, to drink. Um, but I always took the personal perspective that if I was driving somewhere, even if it was to go out for a night out, I did not drink not one drop of alcohol. Because as, and that's the point that I agreed very strongly with Alec Johnson on, is that you can never tell what the impact of a, of a drink will be on you because it can affect you differently depending on how much sleep you've had, how much you've had to eat that day. It has a different impact on you depending on different circumstances. So not just even that it affects the individual, but it can affect the individual differently on a day-by-day -day basis. Therefore, I think it is far better to err on the side of not drinking than to take the risk. I want to look at the issue around campaigns and, and attitudes. Um, in terms of, uh, of social attitudes, um, the, the Lancet has described the, the notion of being arrested for drink driving in Sweden as a social and personal catastrophe. However, uh, to contrast with that, we have the uh, president of the Association of Scottish Police Superintendents, David O'Connor, stating that he still believes drink driving is seen as socially acceptable in some quarters. So we do have an attitudinal issue to address. Um, indeed, uh, an Ipsos Murray poll, which um, I caught sight of today, which looked at attitudes toward the drink drive limit, shows that there is strong agreement. 55% strongly agree with reducing the drink drive limit to 50 milligrams. Support is strongest in the over 55 age group at 73%, which would bear out some of the, some of the uh, testimony from James Dornan there around those who went through the, the period of time when the drink drive uh, campaigns, the hard-hitting drink drive campaigns were there. But interestingly, it demonstrates that support is actually weakest in the 18 to 24 age group. And I think that makes the point around the need for education. It makes the point around the need to focus on a generation who I believe have maybe missed some of the hard-hitting messages. Now, while there have been welcome campaigns, I can think in Grampian uh, of, for example, this year's Morning After campaign, which uh, was launched in June 2012, indeed in the month before, in May, uh, there were 45 arrests alone in Grampian for drink driving, which I think demonstrates some of the, some of the difficulties that are faced. But the Morning After campaign was launched uh, calling on members of the public to report drink drivers themselves. Often people will know somebody has left the pub or the club with the intention of driving, but don't actually take the step of reporting that individual. Often they then find out the next day that that individual has been involved in an accident and then think to themselves, if only I had reported. So it's not just about the attitude of the person themselves who is taking the reckless step of drink driving. 
it's also about those individuals who are aware that that person is drink driving and their responsibilities to ensure that that person is not allowed to cause damage, to cause harm and to potentially cause a fatality. I'll give way. Thank you, Member, for taking Annette the intervention. Um, can, can Mark MacDonald, does he, I don't have the information, but does he have information on the blood alcohol levels of the people who, in that campaign he was referring to in Grampian, were actually charged with drink driving? Mark Mark I, I do not. I feel I am failing in my clear duty to be the Conservative Party's statistician uh, in this debate, but uh, I, I, I'm afraid I don't have the, the, the data on that blood alcohol level. I, I would simply say, look, if, if, if the point of the Conservative uh, Party's argument is that there are people who are significantly over the 80 milligram limit and that won't change with the reduction to the 50 milligram limit, I would contend that simply one of the things, for example, for having the highest uh, alcohol uh, limit allowance in Europe, if not one of the highest in the world, we are therefore setting a particular attitudinal perspective that it's okay to take a drink. You know, the, the notion that you can take a drink and still be under the limit in some circumstances. That sets in train the motion that taking a drink and driving is okay, and then perhaps leads on to some of the more reckless conduct. I would suggest that we need to address some of that attitude at, at issue. Now, you know, the notion that if you drop the drink drive limit to 50 milligrams, there will still be those people who will drink and drive recklessly, I don't think is necessarily an argument for not dropping the drink drive limit based on some of the statistics that I've read out today. One of the other campaigns which is run in uh, the Grampian area is the Driving Ambition Scheme, which is a multi-agency scheme uh, between Grampian police, um, car maintenance experts, driving instructors, fire brigades. It's a wide-ranging uh, course, but part of the course does focus in on drink driving. But I think that while these sorts of campaigns, either seasonal campaigns or campaigns within uh, other campaigns, I have taken two interventions, presiding officer, and, and some members have already spoken much longer than seven minutes. I, I would simply say that I think that the education matter is something that needs to be dealt with on a much more targeted basis, and I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will take that on board. Many thanks, and thanks for your cooperation. I now call on Dennis Robertson to be followed by Siobhan McMahon. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, when uh, Mark MacDonald started talking about Grampian, I felt that I was just going to give way to Javon uh, <laughs> uh, McMahon and just remain in my seat. I've learnt a couple of things this afternoon, Presiding Officer. One, that James Dornan is much older than I first envisaged. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, secondly, that Alex Johnson can actually confuse me in this chamber. Um, Presiding officer, it's a very serious matter, and uh, as people in, are into confiding with this chamber whether they drink or not, can I say that I drink but do not drive? But I do, <laughs> but I do rely on other people uh, driving me, presiding officer, to which I am always very conscious of the fact if uh, we've been to a function or not, and whether or not they've been consuming alcohol or not. Presiding officer, I'm also a parent. A parent of a teenage daughter, a teenage daughter who loves her car. Um, she loves her car because her father bought her the car. Um, but, presiding officer, my daughter, I believe, is a responsible driver. A driver who will go out and engage with other teenagers and go to parties, etc. But she's always willing to be the driver. Probably just the excitement of still being a young driver, and she's quite happy to drive other people who themselves are consuming alcohol. My fear, presiding officer, is not for my daughter and whether or not she consumes alcohol or not, because I believe she would not. It's for other people in, who are driving on the roads who have perhaps consumed alcohol. My daughter cannot legislate for others that are driving. She doesn't know the car that's approaching her, if that driver has overindulged in alcohol or not, and whether she needs to take evasive action. Because the Cabinet Secretary has said already, one death or one accident is too many. And I agree with the Cabinet Secretary. And quite often, presiding officer, it is not the driver who has consumed the alcohol, but the innocent party who has taken action to avoid that driver. Mark MacDonald has referred to initiatives in Grampian. In Grampian, there seems to be a macho culture, presiding officer. 
because about 86% of those convicted of drink driving are male. 86% presiding officer. We need to adjust this culture. We need to ensure that this macho culture of drinking and driving is acceptable because it's not. Presiding officer, the other disturbing statistic is it's a 17 to 35 year old age group that seem to be the ones that believe it's okay to drink and drive. <coughs> presiding officer, it is not. We need to ensure that if we're going to make a real difference, an effective difference, we need to educate our young people much earlier. We need to educate them about the consequences. We need to shift this culture. Like others in this chamber, I did grow up in a culture, maybe in the 50s, 60s and 70s, when it was okay to drink and drive. It's never been okay to drink and drive because your ability is impaired. I actually believe that even 50 milligrams is perhaps too high, but except that it is a better than the 80. Because I believe your impairment is impaired, and I sincerely hope not at the 20 milligram, or I might be uh, deciding to take a, a ship rather than fly, given the information that Stuart Stevenson has given this, the, in this chamber this <laughs> afternoon. Um, I sincerely hope that the impairment is, is at least at the level of 50 milligrams that a person can still drive responsibly. I support the motion before us today, and I sincerely hope across this chamber we find consensus and accept the 50 milligram proposal that's before us. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And thank you. Now call on Siobhan McMahon to be followed by Richard Lyle. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in what is a very important debate regarding an issue I feel strongly about. Cars are supposed to make our lives easier. For the most part, they do. I, for one, could not get by without mine. And there is nothing more tragic than something which is supposed to improve life, destroying life. Every car accident that results in serious injury or death is a travesty. This is especially so when the accident is caused by dangerous driving. It is critical that we send out the message that driving in a way that endangers the safety of other road users will not be tolerated. If you get behind the wheel under the influence of alcohol or drugs or any other substance that impairs reaction and judgment, you are putting yourself and, more importantly, others at risk. Over the last half century, societal attitudes towards drink driving have progressed significantly. The latest Scottish Government figures reveal that casualties resulting from drink driving have fallen by 17% since 1999 alone. However, that still leaves 20 people dead in 2010 as a direct consequence of drink driving, with a further 120 seriously injured. Against this backdrop, I welcome the proposal in the Scottish Government's consultation paper to reduce the drink driving limit from 80 mg to 50 mg, bringing Scotland into line with the rest of Europe. Switzerland, which lowered its blood alcohol limit from 80 mg to 50 in 2005, has seen drink-related road deaths fall by approximately 20 to 30 fatalities per year. The Westminster Parliamentary Advisory Council for Transport Safety, meanwhile, predicted that lowering the UK limit to 50 mg would significantly reduce the fatalities, a position backed by legal expert Sir Peter North, who has called for a reduction to the 50 mg. In a report commissioned by the previous UK Government, he estimated that this could save up to 165 lives in the first year, and as many as 303 after six years. Sadly, however, and against the advice of road safety charities and the British Medical Association, and in spite of support from the AA and REC, Conservative Transport Minister Philip Hammond rejected the findings of the North report, opting to keep the current limits of 80 milligrams. If, as Hammond asserted, while paradoxically de deciding to retain the 80 milligram limit, drink driving is socially unacceptable, why not render it impossible in practice? Even with the limit at 50 mg, there remains a degree of ambiguity. Many people are confused as to how much alcohol constitutes 80 mg. It would be no more certain with the level set at 50 mg. Yes. Hey, I, I, I thank Siobhan McMahon for taking intervention. Would it therefore not be best that if people are confused as to how much they can actually can consume, that they consume nothing at all? Siobhan McMahon. Absolutely, and I think I confess, and again, I am one of those people who drink um, and also drive, but not at the same time, because clearly um, you should roll that out and you should be in that position. And I think the point I was going on to make is no one knows what one drink means. If you drink an alcohol pop, that is one unit. If you drink cider, that is 2.4 units. That is one drink. And I think we have to be clear on what that means as well. And, and 
and to develop that point. Um, so, as I was about to say, this is further complicated by the fact that the effect of alcohol varies according, as Mark Macdonald said earlier, gender, physique, constitution, fatigue and food consumption. What is safe for one person is not necessarily safe for another. We need to put an end to the dangerous and outdated perception of drunk driving as socially acceptable, whilst leaving a necessary margin for error to allow for the trace levels of alcohol in the bloodstream for the reasons that Lewis Macdonald highlighted earlier. In terms of the additional measures recommended by the Scottish Government, many of these require the devolution of further powers. So why not focus on what can we achieve now? My colleague Richard Simpson has already discussed the innovative measures adopted by other countries, which we already have the legislative power to introduce. And there are a number of other steps we could take to reduce the incidence of drink driving. We should certainly explore further restrictions upon alcohol advertising, especially on football strips and in stadiums. A large number of fans drive to and from stadiums. They cannot buy alcohol in the stadium and hopefully have not consumed any before entering, yet they spend 90 minutes surrounded by various images and slogans promoting it. Sports sends out a positive mes message about the benefits of healthy lifestyle, a message hopelessly polluted when mixed with alcohol. I have no doubt that the end of alcohol sponsorship in sport would have a beneficial effect on the level of drink driving. I would also like to see an increase in advertising warnings of the danger of alcohol consumption generally and drink driving in particular. Over the last decade, there have been a number of high-impact campaigns accentuating the risks and consequences of drink driving. I would be interested to learn whether the Scottish Government has planned to launch or sponsor similar campaigns in the near future. Such campaigns are prevalent at Christmas but should reoccur throughout the year. In addition to this, we should emphasise the risk of driving the morning after a night of heavy drinking. As Alice uh, Granville, policy and research analyst at the Institute of Advanced Motoring, recently observed, many drivers who would not consider driving after a night in the pub fail to recognise the influence of alcohol on their body the next day or simply choose to ignore its effects. Drivers need to take responsibility and use alternative means of transport after a heavy night drinking. It is also important that we do not marginalise the, da the dangers of drug driving. Although research on the effects of drug consumption on driving skills is comparatively scarce, it is likely to have the same adverse impact upon reactions and judgment. Finally, and as the Labour Amendment states, the Scottish Government must ensure that any measures taken are effectively enforced. This necessitates a significant police presence, especially on the roads. It is imperative that the frontline police officers remain on the front line. It also demands a robust judicial system. Over the past year, I have been dealing with a tragic case involving the death of a man in an accident caused by another motorist who was found to be in possession of banned substances. I have seen the grief the perpetrator caused, and do not believe that the punishment he received fitted the enormity of his crime. Drivers, driving while intoxicated is a reckless and selfish act. It must be punished to the full extent of the law. If we are to send a clear and unequivocal message, those found guilty of driving under the influence of drink or drugs must be made to face the consequences of their actions. Thank you. Thank you. Now Colin Richard Lyle to be followed by Alison McInnes. Thank you, President Officer. I, I also think that this debate is uh, very timely. And I'd also like to put a, a historical line on the, the debate. Many people think that drink driving laws only came in in the last 40 years. Not true. In 1872, it became an offence to be drunk while in charge of a carriage, horses, cattle, and steam engines. Over the years, and uh, not James, we weren't as old as that then. Uh, over the years, various acts have been enacted. In 1925, it became an offence to be found drunk in charge of any mechanical prepared vehicle on any highway or any public place. 1930, it became an offence to drive, attempt to drive, or be in charge of a motor vehicle on a road or any other public place while being the, under the influence of drink or a drug to such an extent as to be incapable of having proper control of the vehicle. In 1960, this act was updated. In 1962, a.k.a. the Marples Act, the possibility of using blood, urine or breath for alcohol analysis was approached in the Road Traffic Act of 1962. Before this act was introduced, successful drink driving prosecutions relied heavily upon the subjective tests and observations of so-called police surgeons. The Road Traffic Safety Act of 1967 introduced the first legal maximum blood alcohol drink driving limit in the UK. The limit was set at a maximum back blood alcohol concentration 
of 80 milligrams of alcohol per 100 milliliters of blood, or equivalent of 107 milligrams of alcohol per, per 100 milliliters of urine. It became a, an offence to drive, attempt to drive, or be in charge of a motor vehicle with a blood alcohol concentration that exceeded the maximum prescribed legal limit. In 1967, the Breathalyser Act was given royal assent, and the, the comment was made, I think, by Richard Simpson earlier, by the then Transport Minister, Barbara Castle, introduced the breathalyser in a way of testing a person's back blood alcohol concentration level at the roadside. The introduction of the breathalyser in the UK, along with the heavy government-run advertising campaign, helped decrease the percentage of road traffic accidents then, where alcohol had been a factor from 25% to 15% in the first year. There were 1,152 fewer recorded deaths, 11,177 fewer serious injuries, and 28,130 fewer slight injuries caused by road traffic accidents. I note that we have all received uh, submissions, one from particularly the BMA, who supports a reduction in dr drink driving limit because there is a clear evidence that this will reduce the number of deaths and serious injury caused by drink driving. Drivers' reaction times and motoring skills deteriorate even after a small amount of alcohol and get worse with the increased alcohol consumption. Yes, I would. Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I've learnt something else. Richard Lyle is probably much older than I thought he was. Um, but, Presiding Officer, the intervention is to do with uh, Mr. Lyle has actually mentioned motor vehicles. Motor vehicles now are probably much faster and much more dangerous than they were than in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, and I think that in itself is, uh, means that people are probably less likely to um, uh, handle them appropriately if they're under the influence of alcohol. Richard Lyle. I can totally agree with that fact. And, and having driven uh, down to Manchester on numerous occasions on the M6, M74, M8, done about 30, 40,000 miles a year, uh, I see those, as I would call them, I don't know if the language is right, uh, officer, nutters. Um, Yes, um, going at 60, 70, 80, 90 miles. I, I even made actually somebody pass me 100 in, in fog. Uh, lucky the police were about two miles down the road and they got them. And what a laugh I had when I saw that. Anyway, drivers' reaction times and motoring skills deteriorate after a small amount of alcohol. The risk of involvement in the collision rises significantly once the blood alcohol level rises above 50 milligrams per 100 milliliters of blood. And I think the the one speech I've, I've listened intently to, to uh, this afternoon, James Doran, and yes, James, I think I am older than you slightly, we'll, com we'll, compare, we'll compare later. Um, basically, uh, all the things that happened in the 60s were, con were true. And uh, I remember uh, when my father used to play, he was a trumpet player, he used to play all around Lanarkshire. Uh, he always employed me to drive him because he liked to drink. I didn't want him to drive, and, and it was quite good. When I was 18, I, I would get his car, and I'd be able to uh, use his car while he was uh, away playing in a dance band. One thing that does surprise me is how many cars are parked outside pubs and clubs nowadays. Some people believe that you can still have a few pints or indeed a wine and still be able to drive. I learned a long time ago, if you want to take a car to take your friends out for a night, then you only drink soft drinks. As a designated driver, that's what I do. I know several people who have only had two pints and been stopped and charged with drink driving. The lesson is, don't do it or take the chance. Some people don't take the car, but forget that alcohol can still be in your system the next morning, depending on how long ago you previously had a drink. Alcohol stays in your system longer than you think, so don't drink if you're driving the next day. I'm going to finish by saying, I note in that recent Murray poll, most people question support this proposal, the over 55s, which I am one of those people. Drink driving is a total no-no in our society nowadays. We'll betide anyone who does not take that into account, especially as we approach this festive season. I support the motion. Excellent. Many, many thanks. Now call on Alison McInnes to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And will the Scottish Liberal Democrats welcome the government's plan to reduce the drink driving limit in Scotland to 50 milligrams of alcohol per 100 millilitres of blood? 
As we have heard already today, the UK is something of an outlier within Europe on this issue. Only Malta has as high a limit as our current point, 0.8% blood alcohol content. And the last few years, I've seen a host of other countries reducing their drink drive limit to the European Commission recommended level of 0.05%. I must begin by saying that I'm, I'm a wee bit disappointed by the approach taken by the Labour Party to, today, to today's debate. It's not that I disagree with the sentiment of Lewis Macdonald's amendment. After all, I have been amongst the most outspoken critics of the government's police reform plans. But today I had anticipated a more consensual debate where we could rightly concentrate on the important issue at hand, making our roads safer. And when the government's doing the right thing, I will stand up and say so. And on this issue, the evidence speaks for itself. So it's disappointing that Labour have decided to use the debate this afternoon for point scoring rather than focusing on the safety of Scotland's roads. Similarly, let me just make some progress here. Similarly, I am concerned about the last section of Alec Johnson's amendment, intimating that lowering the drink drive limit could have unintended consequences in criminalising less serious behaviour. Moves the debate, I think, into dangerous territory. We can't be drawn into a situation where being a little over the limit is accepted as all right. Rather, we should be sending a clear message, and others have said that this afternoon as well, that you should not drive if you have even had one drink. Let me just make some progress here. The fact is that drink driving should remain a serious issue of concern to us all. Setting a drink drive limit is not as arbitrary an exercise as it might appear in abstract, and the science behind it is developing all the time. In their study from March 2010, the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence found that drivers with a BAC of greater than 0.08% are at least 11 times more likely to be involved in a fatal car crash than drivers without any alcohol in their blood. With less than 0.05%, that risk is reduced to three times as great. One of the greatest problems in addressing drink driving is how hard it is to express in easy to understand terms. And by its nature, alcohol affects each of us differently, and many others have said that this afternoon. At the levels we are talking about, for most people, the change to 50 milligrams would be the difference of not having a second pint of beer or having a smaller glass of wine. But the difficulty comes in people judging how much they are affected. Many people will not feel any noticeable effects even past the point where they have become legally intoxicated. Clearly, in an ideal world, no one would get behind the wheel of a car with alcohol in their system. In practice, however, we must recognise that a zero-tolerance policy has serious technical and practical difficulties to adhere to. And while keeping our roads and the people who use them safe has to be our primary concern, there is a fine balance that we must strike. Of course, setting the limit is not in itself the answer to reducing drink driving. We have to take a proactive approach in educating drivers of all ages, but particularly younger drivers, and engaging with people to emphasise that putting yourself and others at risk by driving drunk is simply not acceptable. If we take the example of the North East, last year there were 206 road collisions where alcohol was a contributory factor, 6% of all accidents. But alcohol was a factor in as many as 25% of all fatal accidents. Grampian Police this year launched their morning after campaign, I think Mark MacDonald made reference to that earlier, aimed directly at getting local communities involved at reducing drink driving at a local level. And the campaign is hoping not just to encourage people to report drink drivers, but to do what they can to prevent people driving drunk in the first place. And that's the sort of approach that we need to encourage. There is only so much that can be achieved through action here in Parliament. The Cabinet Secretary in his opening remarks touched upon the possibility of devolving further powers, particularly with regard to setting a stricter limit for young or newly qualified drivers, and there is, of course, growing evidence base on drink driving amongst younger drivers, which has been touched on by other members. The most prevalent counter-argument to this approach has been put forward by ROSPA, and that is that a risk that young drivers who are subject to a lower drink drive limit would be more likely to drink and drive when they reached the age at which they became subject to the higher limit for other drivers, because they thought that they could then drink more and drive. Personally, I'm more inclined to believe that once young drivers are in the habit of not drinking before driving, they're less likely to do so as they get older. In any case, we have seen other countries, notably Ireland, have recently introduced a graduated limit, and so it will be interesting to reflect on their evidence and experience, and I would be very happy to work with the government in revisiting this aspect in the future. As for the motion today, the Scottish Liberal Democrats are content to offer our support. We look forward to the results of the government's consultation being published and the reduced limit being introduced in Parliament. Thank you very much.
I now call on Stuart Stevenson to be followed by David Stewart. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and let me start by drawing members' attention to my membership of the Institute of Advanced Motorists, uh, an organisation that is interested in training uh, drivers for safety. We now have the ability to change the legal alcohol limit of drivers in Scotland. We can all clearly identify that drink driving is an obvious hazard. When you combine that with our rather unpredictable weather and dark roads uh, during Scotland's winters, we have a toxic mix that we need to tack tent of. Less alcohol in the bloodstream of fewer drivers equals fewer accidents and fewer deaths. So changing the legal blood alcohol content levels from 80 milligrams to 50 milligrams per 100 milliliters of blood delivers much at little cost and with no real inconvenience. And it's a positive change which I and many others clearly from the debate have supported for a long time. Countless stories can be told of loss, pain, death, injury resulting from the reduced coordination, slowed motor skills, blurred vision, poor judgment and impairing effects of alcohol upon drivers. We have the opportunity for Scotland here to take the lead, just as the Labour-led administration, to their eternal credit, uh, did with smoking. BMA tells us that driving becomes considerably more risky once the alcohol level rises above 50 milligrams per 100 milligrams of blood. Despite a 10 times greater risk compared to sobriety, we currently let drivers at 80 milligrams into cars to drive legally on our streets. So what would a reduction really mean? Dramatically reduces the crash risk at 50 milligrams to one-fifth of the level at 80 milligrams. Still double that of a non-drinking driver, but in enormous advance over the current arrangement. Risk rises steeply with increase in alcohol in the bloodstream. The rest of Europe has done it. A good percentage of the rest of the world is time we did it. A report provided by the International Centre for Alcohol Policies demonstrates that Austria, Denmark, the United States and Sweden showed a decrease in the number of, quote, reported drink drive trips and injurious or fatal accidents after the levels were lowered. We know that it works. Uh, Lewis MacDonald had a little bit to say about devolution, and that's not the core of the debate. Let's do what we've got. Uh, I do think, however, it might be useful if devolution handed whole policy areas over. I'm in favour, as we know, of 100% devolution of everything, but that's not today's debate. Uh, I, I think it would be simpler for the administrations, both sides of the border, frankly, if we conducted things that way. Uh, Richard Simpson, an ever thoughtful contribution on matters of health, um, talked about France. I've just come back from France. There was a bit of confusion. I actually thought I needed uh, the breathalysers in the hire car that I had and was a bit disconcerted to find they weren't there. I'm glad to find I was driving legally uh, rather than in terror. I'm also pleased to hear that Dennis Robertson doesn't drive, although, <laughs> although I have twice participated in the Grampian Society for the Blinds driving day where blind people and blindfolded members of the Scottish Parliament drive around a racetrack against a time trial. So interesting uh, to think about, uh, 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 about that. <laughs> Dennis Robertson. If, if the member's going to promise he'll be seen driving sometime soon, yes, of course. Um, I thank Mr. Stevens for taking the intervention. Can I say that all the driving instructors at the Afford uh, Transport Museum, when taking uh, their blind or blindfolded members around the car, uh, have not been drinking? Stuart Stevenson. Uh, can I say many of the blind drivers have displayed far greater skills than drivers with sight, but with lots of alcohol uh, in their system. Uh, we had a historical uh, lesson from Richard Lyle. Uh, my father, as many GPs, used to test in the 1950s people who were brought in as potential drunks to see if they could walk along a white line. Thank goodness, uh, and Richard Simpson clearly remembers that as well. Thank goodness we've now moved to a more scientific uh, basis of testing, one that's much more uh, objective. But as we change the limit, as change we must, we have to have a programme of education and information that really gets 
home to the difficult to reach groups that are actually our driving recidivists and I use that term uh, advisedly. We have to be in a position where nobody can in practice say I didn't again. It's never an excuse in law but it's got to not be an excuse that people can deploy in, in, in practice. The International Centre for Alcohol Policies again states heightened public awareness of drink driving issues largely responsible for decreases in drink driving infractions following the lowering of limits. And that's an important uh, point that we need to uh, take account of. I, I caution Alec Johnson, who I think is getting very confused about statistics, of course, the risk of people three, four times above the limit is dramatically higher, probably 50 times higher than, a sub, than sobriety. But that doesn't alter the fact that most people who are over the limit are near the limit and in numerical terms are responsible uh, for most of the accidents that we seek to advise. The world has changed. When my father was a GP in the 1950s, he could actually prescribe alcohol to his anemic patients. Stout, uh, we used to get samples of sweetheart stout and Guinness uh, sitting in the surgery uh, waiting to go out. Let me just close, presiding officer, by making a few more comments about aviation. Um, it's worth saying, by the way, our breathalysers in Scotland are already calibrated to test at the 20 uh, milligram level. That comes from questions I asked uh, of the previous uh, executive in session two. There is an additional requirement placed on uh, pilots beyond the 20 milligrams. They are forbidden to drink for eight hours before they fly. So th th there are further things we can think about in the future. I pose the question, if you want your pilots to be at that kind of standard for safety, why would you get into a car where somebody is operating uh, to low, lower level? Lower levels, systematic breath testing, that's what we need to save lives and ensure tra safe travel. I'm very happy to support the government's motion today. Many thanks. And I call on David Stewart to be followed by Nigel Don. And there is still a little time left for those who wish to take interventions. Uh, thank you, um, President Officer. I welcome uh, this debate today on the issue of drink driving, and I'd like to focus uh, my remarks particularly on young driver safely, safety. I would like to start with sign officer by reading part of a blog that was posted on a well-known site only this week from the best friend of a drink driver. And I quote, we all enjoy our nights out, but my mate takes it too far. He's never aggressive or anything when he's drunk, but last Friday night was the tipping point for many of us that go out. We found out that after 18 pints of Caffrey's, 10 JD and Cokes and various shot, shots of liqueurs, he actually drove the three miles home. All that started at 5 p.m. and ended at 4 a.m. This has got to stop. If he'd hit anyone or anything, they'd have never known about it. My take on this, if that he's stupid enough to do it, then he has to face the consequences. But that's not just him that would suffer. So would his wife his three children, and God forbid the poor family of the person that he hits, unquote. President Officer, after, after having spent years campaigning for driver safety, I've learned a lot about the tragedies involved with drink driving, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about the solutions to this crucial aspect of driver safety. The trigger for me was the tragic death of two 17-year-olds in Inverness in March 2010, directly linked to drink driving. After that, I formed a group and led a local campaign in the Highlands and Islands called Sensible Driving, Always Arriving. In this particular case, during the small hours of March morning two years ago, the local 17-year-old took out her car. She was under the influence of alcohol. Although a learner driver, she went for a drive around Inverness and when driving saw a male pal of hers who was only minutes from his home. She offered him a lift, which she accepted, she then accelerated to 100 miles an hour within the town, struck a, tea, a tree, killing both of them, and in the process, nearly destroying two families and their many friends with grief. Presiding officer, it is a truism, which is not depleted by repetition, that there's no greater tragedy, no greater sorrow, and no greater loss than for a parent to lose a child. And although, of course, drink driving appears to be a single issue, as many members have mentioned, is in fact a diverse problem that includes various dimensions, such as alcohol abuse, underage drinking, and other social concerns, as of course were identified in the North Review and the NICE Report of 2010. 
So solutions need to be equally internet and wide ranging, demanding comprehensive, creative and flexible approach. It's important, of course, to view drink driving within the broader context of public health implications of alcohol abuse. As a result, solutions must take into account drinking patterns and groups particularly at risk. So as a Highlands and Islands road safety campaigner, I, of course, welcome any measures that improve road safety and reduce fatalities and serious injuries as a result. Many members have mentioned some statistics, and I would echo that briefly. Tragically, the figures show that one in every nine deaths on Scottish roads each year involve drivers who are over the legal uh, drink driving limit, with an average of 30 deaths on Scottish roads caused by drivers over the legal limit each year. In 2010, 750 carriages and 20 deaths. Now, many campaign organisations, such as Living Streets, who I think wrote to all members, have called for no alcohol consumption before driving. It's to stop what I would call, and many members have referred to this, the driver's Russian roulette. Will it be okay to drink with one or one and a half pints or maybe two pints or maybe more? But what else can we do? Well, I firmly believe that we need to continue to provide a series of measures to tackle this serious issue. Already in some areas in the north, as indeed across Scotland, the drunk driver is kept in custody to appear before court the next day. Courts, of course, can impose immediate disqualification and, as the Cabinet, said, Cabinet Secretary said in his remarks, can also seize the drunk driver's vehicle. So my campaign, Sensible Driving Always Arriving, represents, I think, a chance to target drink driving before it starts. This campaign is targeted at new or young drivers, and as a group we are pushing for the introduction of a graduated licence scheme. This scheme would see measures such as extending the test taking place, which would involve night driving and driving on dual carriageways. There will also a period of observational driving, and I'm happy to give away. Stevenson. Uh, can I say I'm absolutely with them on uh, graduated uh, licences, but would the member also accept that it's really also to do with an experience and it should apply to drivers in the early part of their driving career, whatever their age? It's not simply about young people. Uh, yeah, no, I Stewart. totally agree with them. That's a, a very good point. Most, most new drivers are under 25, but the member is quite right. Drivers starting out over 60, for example, should also be part of this particular uh, scheme. So the other issue, uh, President Officer, is obviously there's a limit on the number of passengers involved in cars as well. There are a number of other proposals in the scheme, but one of the key things which links in today's debate is there's a nearest possible zero level of alcohol involved in, in this scheme as well. And as we've heard, uh, NICE looked at evidence across the world uh, on zero tolerance and graduate licence schemes. They asked the question, what would help reduce alcohol-rated injuries uh, and deaths? Now, they quoted one study which showed that with zero tolerance that reduced the number of deaths among underage drinkers by a quarter, which is a fantastic figure. And three US studies showed that zero tolerance laws changed the pattern of alcohol consumption and drink driving behaviours of young people overall. And perhaps the most interesting one for me was the study of graduated driving licence schemes in New Zealand, which showed that for young drivers, crashes were less likely, they were less likely to be at night because of restrictions, less likely to not have passengers because of restrictions, and, of course, less likely to have drivers with alcohol. And, of course, we know that the North Review called for reductions in drink driving limits, but as we heard, the UK Transport Minister said, and I quote, that persistent drink drivers were less likely to be deterred by reductions in the limit rather than by a greater prospect of being caught. I was going to ask the Cabinet Secretary if he wished to comment, but perhaps the, the Minister might do uh, in, in his place. So, in conclusion, presiding officer, the international press best practice would suggest that countries with the lowest drink driving figures have three things in common. First of all, a long track record of drink driving enforcement, including a low legal limit. Secondly, a high level of detection. And thirdly, mass media support for enforcement. For young drivers in particular, graduated licence schemes with restriction on passengers and night driving and zero tolerance of alcohol and increased education will reduce the carnage on our roads and the death and injury of our young people across Scotland. Many thanks. I now call on Nigel Dawn to be followed by Claire Adamson. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I have to say this has been a, a more interesting debate than I'd feared it might be, actually. I thought it might be a very long afternoon on a relatively simple subject, uh, and we've heard some really quite interesting input. Uh, I would just like, uh, because I have been holding a driving licence for, I think, deplorably now 40 years, just to recognise one or two things that have been said about the, uh, the traffic conditions in which we drive. Um, I don't think there's any dispute at all that there's more traffic on the roads. There are actually a few more roads, of course. 
But I would like to make the point that my observation is that our roads are a great deal better than they were, and they're certainly a great deal safer because I'm seeing crash barriers and central reservations in places where they certainly weren't once upon a time. Could I also make the point that our cars are seriously safer, more reliable, and I'm not just referring to safety belts or even airbags, but it seems to me that our tyres and braking systems are hugely better than they used to be, uh, and it's against that background that I think we need to maybe reflect on the statistics. Uh, uh, who do you wish to take? Let me defer to Dennis first. Uh, Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Mr Dolan, yeah, you're referring to the cars being safer, but they're also faster. And I think part of the problem is that because they're faster and people have impaired uh, ability in these cars, they're probably more dangerous. Well, can I, can I just uh, uh, answer Den Dennis Robertson by saying, yes, they probably are faster, most of them. But as I do recall going up the M1 with my dad driving at 100 miles an hour, I still think at the upper limit they're probably roughly the same place. <laughs> Uh, I just wonder very simply if the member would agree with me that evolution is working at a slower rate and the human being has not improved at anything faintly like the same rate. I, 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 I absolutely don't. agree. Uh, and, and because, uh, sorry, I, I, I'm with you. I just wanted to put that in as a part of the background which had not previously been discussed. Can I say, I, I, I think there is a, a huge support for what's been talked about. We've heard a lot of the statistics. Uh, we've heard a lot of the support from professionals, and I don't really want to, to, to go into that. What I would like to do, though, is to refer to a subject, return to a subject which has been discussed, I think particularly by Dr. Richard Simpson, and this is not the first time it's been discussed this week because we were talking about this in the members' debate only on Tuesday. Law can do some things, but culture does a lot more. Uh, and I, I think it was James Dornan from the very beginning talked about the culture uh, and his own attitude, to, which I share. And I think it's a generational thing, and I note that members uh, have referred to, to younger ages. Uh, Dennis Robertson suggested it was the 17 to 35-year group. Mark MacDonald, it's the 18 to 24. I don't think I really know, and I don't want to fight about the numbers. But it does seem to me that we really do need some serious research on this, because if we're going to change the culture, we need to be very clear whose culture it is we're changing, because there will be very different messages to youngsters than to our age. Um, and Stuart Stevenson also made the comment about the hard-to-reach drink driver, and I don't think he was maybe the only, the only one who's referred to that, that issue in, in the discussion. Uh, again, I think we need to do a little bit of research on who that hard-to-drink, sorry, hard-to-reach uh, drink driver actually is. I suspect the police have a pretty clear idea, but clearly anything we're going to do for the culture of them needs to be done specifically for them. What I would like to concentrate on, presiding officer, is some thoughts about what else might be devolved. Uh, again, I think I adopt the position that Stuart Stevenson said that, uh, of course, I would prefer everything to be, do, to, to be given to this country's uh, parliament to consider. But I do think there are some other issues which might well come with this. Uh, and again, it's not uh, perhaps the first time. I think the police powers to stop and search are ones that would be very useful. I'm not generally in favour of giving the police arbitrary powers to stop. But I think in this area it really would be helpful. I suspect that at the moment they're quite good at stopping the right people, but probably for some other reason, and then maybe checking on the alcohol level of the breath. I think it would be very much better if they didn't have to do that kind of thing. I think it would be very much better if they had a clear opportunity to stop and search in circumstances where they think they're going to, they're going to find somebody who's over the limit, uh, and I would very much support that. I, I also hear all the things that Dave Stewart and others have said about young drivers, um, and I entirely take Alison McKinney's point about the fact that if young drivers have had a lower level when they start, they actually get used to the idea they're not going to drink. I think that's a very coherent point, uh, which I would entirely accept. But again, those are things we can't currently do, and it wouldn't have to be good if we could do them within the Scottish Parliament now. I would just like to refer to one other thing, though, presiding officer, that would come with that, uh, a matter very dear to my heart and to dear to some of my constituents. And that is that I note that one of the other things that we cannot deal with um, is the fact that very large vehicles, for example, mobile cranes, are not subject to MOTs, are driving around our roads with a very different safety regime. Nothing to do with alcohol levels, I, I, I can accept. Uh, a very different safety regime uh, in, in Scotland and indeed in the rest of the UK from other vehicles. And it does seem to me to be that's something we ought to be able to address. I notice the UK from correspondence that I've got doesn't want to address it and I would be very grateful if we had the opportunity to address it in Scotland. So I add that to the list of things that we would be able to address were we independent. If I might briefly at the end then 
turn to Alex Johnson's comments about unintended consequences. Can I say to Mr. Johnson that I was not confused by what he was saying. I think he was making a perfectly fair point, which I think the record will put straight when it is read, because uh, he started very clearly by recognizing that all offenses were offenses. I can quite understand his point about soft targets for people who are trying to get statistics. My point, I think, to him would be that I think I believe our police would not do that. I think our police would actually target the right place. But no, if I can end with sympathy for his cause, uh, but a clear statement that I think the police know what they really should be doing and by and large would do it. Thank you very much. I now call Claire Adamson to be followed by Margaret McCullough. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In 2007, I was nominated onto the Scottish Action Prevention Council Executive. Um, they have committees that cover road, home and water safety. And it gave me an opportunity to work with professionals in this area, such as road safety officers, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents and the Blue Right Services. And while I remain no expert in this area, it has given me a very personal commitment to accident prevention. And today, um, we have touched on some of the costs of accidents. And um, I think Dave Stewart gave a very good example of the personal costs of, of a fatal accident. Um, but I would, I'd like to mention a little bit about the financial cost and the cost to society. Both Baker T Tilly report for the Institute of Advanced Motoring in 2009 and the Rosper report have sought to estimate the cost of fatal accidents. Um, this is a, a, an estimation based on the burden of society, including loss of production, healthcare costs, social benefits costs, and also the, um, the cost of the Blue Right services. And it is estimated that to be 1.8 million per accidental death. And I'll just repeat that. £1.8 million pounds cost to society per fatal accident. Interesting in the, the context of preventative spend. But this figure and no figure could represent the personal cost to the families, including those of the, the drivers involved, who um, th have put their own families' security um, have, have damaged their friends, their families, and, and, and the innocent victims um, have, that have been affected by this reckless behaviour of drink-impaired drivers. And I use that term very, very carefully because it takes so little alcohol consumption for impairment to be present in a driver. And um, this is detailed in um, Road Safety Scotland's report into drink driving and drug driving. And they say there is no fail-safe guide to how much you can drink and stay under the limit. Any alcohol, even a small drink, will impair driving ability. And the only safe course is not to drink any alcohol prior to driving. And from their research, they have shown that impairment judgment of distances, impaired ability of the eyes and changing light conditions, impaired sensitivity to red lights, and severe impairment of ability to react and concentrate exists at the current drink driving limit. And even with the proposed limit, there is still impairment in locating and moving lights correctly and judging distances, and there is still a tendency to take risks. And we have had some discussion about the attitude to sobering up and what represents a, a safe morning after driving ability. And Road Safety Scotland have also gone on to do some research in this area. It shows that after four drinks in an evening, most motorists will be over the limit the next day. 12 hours to be safe after drinking one bottle of wine. 12 hours to be safe after just four pints of continental lager or ale. And then they, they have researched also who is drinking the morning after, and it's shown that one in three motorists have driven what they believe to be under the morning after, over the limit. Half of all young drivers admit to driving in the morning despite excessive drinking the night before. And half of the male drivers in the UK admit to driving in the last year within two hours of having a drink. So I understand the point that Alex Johnson was making. And um, while the, there is a bit of um, understanding that this is an educational issue, um, while ignorance is no excuse for driving under the limit, I think the more positive message that we can do is there is no excuse for ignorance because we have to move this debate away from what the legal limits are to actually about personal responsibility and making societal change in our attitude towards alcohol. 
I mentioned ROSPA earlier on in the speech, and ROSPA has a long-standing campaign in this area. And if I could just read out some of their um, main areas of, of um, in their campaign that they wanted to see established, it was the lowering of the maximum blood alcohol level to 50 milligrams per 100 mils, evidential roadside breath testing, wider powers for the police to breath test drivers and enable targeted, evidence-led and high-profile random breath testing to increase drivers' perception of the risk of being caught without necessarily placing additional demands upon police resources. A wider use of drink drive rehabilitation courses, encouragement for employers to set zero limits for staff who drive for work, and improved public education, in particular to raise awareness of how easy it is to be above the limit and how difficult it is to know exactly how many units of alcohol have been consumed. And when I welcome that the Government have brought forward the proposals within the current constitutional arrangement to lower the limit, I do believe that there is much more that we could have been able to do with further powers in Scotland. I was questioned earlier in the, the, the week by a school visiting the Parliament and uh, one primary six pupil said to me, what difference have you made as a politician? It was quite a daunting question and I have to say I probably shouldn't admit to having to think about it for quite a while because it is a difficult question but I have absolutely no doubt today that if we support the government in this motion, today we'll be saving lives in Scotland's roads. Thank you very much. I now call Margaret McCulloch to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, President Officer. If anything should focus minds in this debate, then it is the reported road casualty figures that we've been hearing about from Transport Scotland. 750 casualties and 20 deaths on Scotland's roads attributed to drink and driving in one year alone. This is not the first time that we as, that we as a parliament have debated Scotland's relationship with alcohol. But this is the first time that we have done so with the power to determine the drink drive limit. We have a choice to make, and we make, when we make that choice, we have to keep the safety and well-being of the Scottish people foremost on our minds. We are approaching the festive period, and every year at this time, the Scottish Government and their partners in the police mount a campaign to remind Christmas partygoers about the consequences of drink driving. In 2010, 7,000 people were caught driving under the influence of drink or drugs, and those figures spiked in December, as they do every year, despite the severity of the penalties. Offenders don't just face the prospect of a ban or a fine, but they face a criminal record, and they could have their car taken from them if they're convicted of the most serious offences. It's a mistake they keep paying for if they lose their job or even lose their dignity when explaining to their family just what has happened. But while the figures are stark and the consequences are clear, we still have some way to go if we are to achieve the culture change and the improvements in road safety that we all want to see. We know from experience that it is possible to challenge and change behaviour. It wasn't all that long ago that Scotland had a much more relaxed attitude towards drinking and driving, but things have changed, and now the vast majority of people quite rightly regard drink driving as unacceptable. Seat belts are now standard in both front and back seats, and while a minority still haven't got the message that seat belts save lives, most people have learned to think about their safety when they travel because of a concerted effort to educate the public. With this latest consultation, the Parliament has an opportunity to carry that change in attitude through to its logical conclusion. The Republic of Ireland recently aligned itself with other countries in the European Union in reducing their blood alcohol limit for drivers from 80 mg to per 100 ml to 50. And the devolved administration in Northern Ireland have made clear their intention to follow too. The most common limit across Europe, even in countries which have a more mature and responsible relationship with alcohol than our own, is 50 mg, and so it makes sense to fully explore reducing limits here. Evidence from the North report, which has been quoted from members in a variety of sources, suggests that where a driver's blood alcohol content is between 50 and 80 mg per 100 ml, 
they are six, six times more likely to be involved in a fatal accident. Obviously, the risk of a fatal accident is greater if the concentration of alcohol in a driver's blood is higher. But whatever the concentration and whoever the driver, the dangers associated with drinking, even in modest quantities, and then driving are undeniable. Legislation must reflect the level of danger, and so I welcome the consultation and I hope that expert opinion from the BMA, the WHO and our European neighbours will be taken on board. Ultimately, responsibility for enforcing a change in the law will fall to the police, and as the Labour Amendment makes clear, frontline policing in Scotland has been put under real pressure. The Scottish Government should be clear about how it expects the new police service to find resources for engaging with motorists and preventing drink and driving through traffic education programmes. I spoke earlier about the common and recurrent campaign over the festive period to target drink, and dri drink drivers. However, at the moment, different forces support different programmes throughout the year. In September, I asked the Cabinet Secretary in a written question what programmes were to be supported by the single police service, and he says that this would be a matter for the Chief Constable. I accept his answer, but given the importance that his own government attaches to this issue, I would have hoped for some more clarity. Can I just finish, please? This, I'm going to carry on about this. I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to look at examples of best practice in prevention, preventative spending and driver education from Scotland's existing police forces, with a view to rolling out an effective nationwide initiative when the single police service takes over. Presiding officer, I welcome this consultation and I agree with much of what has been proposed. But in supporting the Labour Amendment, I would say that we have to do more than change the law to deal with drink, drink driving. We have to get behind all those who are responsible for changing the drinking culture and all those who enforce our road safety laws in Scotland to keep motorists and the general public safe from harm. Thank you. Thank you. I now call John Mason, and there is time if uh, you wish to take any interventions. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I look forward to lots of interventions. Um, as you see, I am the final speaker for the SNP today, and one of the reasons for that is because, unfortunately, Dave Thompson uh, cannot be with us today because of family illness, and I think he is somebody who has devoted a lot of time and effort and has made progress on this subject, so I would just want to commend him uh, for that at the start of my speech. Uh, I think, uh, as Margaret McCulloch has just been talking about, I also wanted to touch on this theme. We need to look at the whole question of alcohol. Uh, although specifically today we are focusing on alcohol in relation to driving. I think, as a number of speakers have said, we accept that uh, we do have a problem in Scotland uh, with alcohol. I do not always think it is helpful for us to be comparing ourselves uh, with England at every single turn, uh, but I think we have to be realistic that we have more of a problem than a number of other countries, and that certainly seems to include England. There is not one easy answer uh, to all of this, and I think a number of speakers again have made the point that we need to change people's way of thinking. Uh, it's difficult, but it has been done before. And the example of uh, seatbelts has, has also been given already today, which at the time was considered quite draconian when it was introduced, and yet now I think has been widely accepted and adhered to. And similarly with smoking, it, it has moved from being very cool right across society to where many people now apologise, uh, even if they are smoking and they go outside uh, and all that kind of thing. So our attitude to alcohol can change, and that, I believe, is why minimum pricing is so important. It's not just a question of can we predict exactly, will it affect 25%, 50%, 75% of people or whatever. But uh, as Richard Simpson, I think, said in his contribution, uh, the whole attitude has been changed in a country like France, and it's important that we send out the message that much as many of us enjoy alcohol, it is potentially a harmful substance. Uh, yes. Dennis Roberts. Thank you, President. Yeah. Officer, I didn't want to disappoint my colleague, uh, John Mason, by not giving him an intervention. Um, culture and attitude. Do you believe, then, that employers have a responsibility to their employees coming up to the festive season to indicate to them that they should not 
drink and drive. If they're going out to enjoy themselves at a works party, leave the car at home, look for alternatives, and perhaps employers themselves could actually do that. And again, publicans in the bars, restaurants, etc., um, where we have, and they know that people are coming with vehicles, should maybe indicate to the people that are uh, partaking of alcohol to take their keys from them. John Mason. Yes, I, th I think that widens it out, and I think that's actually quite useful that... Uh, Something I was going to say later on, I'll just say it just now, uh, was the whole question of carrots and sticks, that I don't think it's just a question of beating people on this and a number of other questions, but it's also to do with offering people alternatives and making the alternatives attractive. And absolutely, the employer can be part of that as well. But the particular example I was going to give was the whole question of public transport, uh, and I think that hasn't been mentioned very much uh, tonight. Now, there have been good examples of public transport. I think, for example, buses being laid on free in some of the cities eh, round about Hogmanay and New Year. And I think that's a, a very good example eh, and could perhaps be expanded. But we do have a problem in some of our cities, obviously I'm from Glasgow, eh, where public transport often stops too early eh, for the nightclubs coming out at maybe three or four in the morning or whatever it is. Taxis are very expensive. I consider them really quite a luxury product and try not to use them. And so I think we do need a joined-up approach eh, and bring in public transport to all of this as well. And maybe a good employer can, in fact, lay on a free bus for, for staff. Mr. Matt McDonald. McDonald. Thank the member for taking an intervention. On a, on a slightly tangential point, but linked, um, I remember when I was at university, um, the student union operated a designated driver scheme where those coming in and driving would be given vouchers which they could exchange for free soft drinks. Does he think that's an, uh, an, an issue which, for example, publicans and clubs should look at exploring in order to encourage responsible driving behaviour? John Mason. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that is exactly the, the kind of carrot, the idea of encouraging uh, one person to go without and not to drink uh, that I think uh, we need. Now, uh, to say, uh, I said, I think, that our attitude to alcohol needs to change and today, obviously, we're concentrating on alcohol and driving. But I did use the word hour deliberately because I, th I think to confess, you know, I have driven in the morning eh, after having had a few drinks the night before and have certainly wondered if I was over the limit. And I suspect that over the course of my life, eh, once or twice, eh, I have been over the limit. Um, and I suspect a lot of people, as has been touched on already, have taken the risk in the morning who would not have considered driving at night. The present limit sends out the message that, uh, as James Dorner, I think, talked about, that uh, some drinking and driving is OK. And that leads us to thinking that where do you actually draw the line? My, my own line has tended to be that I would have one glass of wine with a meal if I'm out uh, over a few hours in the evening. But it's easy to make that one pint of beer. And then it's easy to think that the one pint might become two pints. And then perhaps without the meal, but just a packet of crisps. And it so drifts along that the two become acceptable together. We drift into thinking that drinking and driving is OK. And I think we are agreed that limits cannot be zero for practical reasons. But I do think the position we want to move towards is that if you are driving, you just do not drink. And I have to confess that since moving into politics, my attitude has changed eh, a little bit. Because the thought of getting caught for drink driving it would not uh, do an awful lot for my political career, I am fairly sure. Now, the Scotland Act has also been mentioned, and I think uh, we feel... Uh, yes, uh -huh. Claire Adamson. Would the member, it was interesting that the member felt a, a personal responsibility as a politician of a stigma attached to drink driving, but do you not think we need to get to the position where the whole of society regards drink driving as totally unacceptable and to be a stigma on anyone who is convicted? Mr Mason, before I call you back, I have to ask your benches to my right if they could give you some order for the rest of your speech. John Mason. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, I mean, I do agree with the point that uh, Claire Adamson makes, that there's a whole society attitude needs to change. And, I mean, I can identify, obviously, James Dorn and people a lot older than me, but um, I uh, can identify with... The, the, some of the things people have said about attitudes changing over time, and Dick Lyle talked about driving his father eh, around. I used to drive my father around. It was great to get my hands on the Triumph 2000, I think it was, that he drove at that time. But um, there is a whole attitude thing, and I see it in my life. And where I want to move now, I think, too, is that when I go out for a meal, I just do not have a drink at all. And eh, I think eh, many of us eh, need to move in that direction. That's why I've said it's our attitude, I think, that needs to change. 
Uh, to mention the Scotland Act, I, as a, I think it is a pretty second rate on a number of fronts. Many of us uh, would disagree with it on a number of issues. Uh, but having been on the committee for that, uh, I think it is particularly disappointing that uh, we were only given some powers over drink driving and not others. Uh, I do feel that is because there is a fear at Westminster that if Scotland becomes too different from England, uh, then independence would become inevitable. And so even good changes must be resisted if it, if it meant that Scotland was going to become too different uh, from where England is. Mr Mason, I and I must ask you if you could draw to a conclusion. In conclusion, right, okay, I will do that. Um, thank you. Um, if I can just touch finally then on the Conservative Amendment, uh, which I find somewhat disappointing and uh, very much agree with Alison McInnes and the comments she made. If you look at actually some of the wording, uh, I mean, it looks sensible at first glance, and then you realise that it's just about delay and trying to put things off and not actually doing anything. And you look at the words like, must not be implemented until, things must be fully explored. Well, if you're cynical, nothing ever gets fully explored. Uh, fully consider and unintended consequences. Well, everything we do has unintended consequences. So it suggests that that motion would not really take us anywhere. So in conclusion, presiding officer, I'm very happy to support this motion uh, and I thank you for the leniency you've given me over time. Thank you very much. Um, that brings us to the closing speeches and I call on Nanette Millen with a generous seven minutes. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, this has been an important debate, and I think it's been a very informed debate with significant contributions from all sides of the Chamber. As has been stated previously, I think we'd all agree that one of the greatest scourges of modern society is drink driving, and indeed drug driving, uh, which can devastate the lives and, f lives and families, not only of the victims involved, but of the perpetrators as well. Those of us in the chamber, like myself, old enough to remember when the drink drive limit was introduced in 1966, will recall what a necessary step it was as a response to growing concerns about the number at that time of drink impaired people getting behind the wheel. Unfortunately, there are still some individuals of my generation who almost look back with rose tinted spectacles at a supposed halcyon age when it was thought acceptable, especially in rural areas, to have a few drinks at the local pub and then get into your car and drive home. The one for the road. Stuart Stevenson. Um, does the member remember it was even worse than that, in that we, until the reform of the Licensing Act in the early 60s, Sunday drinking required you to drive a minimum of three miles before you were allowed to drink under the bona fide driver rule. Travel Daniel rule. Mellon. I accept that intervention. I, I, I thought it was actually a five-mile limit, but perhaps the member is right. <laughs> um, no, I, I think that is the case. And I mean, there was a one-for-the-road culture. And even going out for a meal in people's houses, you'll just have another one for the road. And that, that was quite accepted and it was done by quite responsible people. In fact, I think I was at the time. Uh, still am. Um, and at that time, as Nigel Dawn pointed out, there was less traffic on the roads than there is today. And it didn't drive so fast. Um, but that attitude wasn't acceptable then, and it certainly isn't acceptable now. Many of us will be aware of the work of the Campaign Against Drink Driving, founded in 1985 by John Knight and Graham Buxton, two fathers who both lost children in road crashes caused by drunken drivers. And all of us will have been affected by the hard-hitting advertisements on television, especially at Christmas time, as we've heard during the debate, which reinforce the message that it simply is not worth it to drink having to drive having drunk alcohol, and yet people still do. The key message is simply don't drink and drive, a message which I and many other people do adhere to. And I do have some sympathy with the argument that this should be mandatory, given the fact that people cannot accurately estimate the safe level of alcohol consumption. I also recognise that each person's metabolism and tolerance level is different, but, but these are debates for another day, although they were touched on by Mark MacDonald in his speech this afternoon. Presiding officer, a case clearly can be made to lower the drink driving limit. But what our amendment seeks to highlight are other measures which may achieve an even more effective response to the serious crime of drink driving. I very much welcome the consultation launched by the Justice Secretary. And I fully acknowledge the fact that the drink driving limit has remained unchanged since the 1960s and that 80 milligrams per, uh, per 100 ml of blood, the current level, is amongst the highest in the world. 
Compared to other European countries, where the level is 50 milligrams per 100 mil, this does seem to be excessively high, especially when we consider that our near neighbour, the Republic of Ireland, lowered its limit last year from 80 to 50 and to 20 milligrams for learner, newly qualified and professional drivers. The Scottish Government obviously believes that lowering the limit will have a positive effect on reducing the number of incidents of drink driving, and I do hope that a lowering of the limit will result in fewer accidents caused in this way. But given the number of drivers who continue to ignore the existing limits and drive when very significantly over the limit, I'm not yet wholly convinced that this will prove to be the case. But I do feel strongly that scarce resources should be focused on those who blatantly flout the existing law, getting behind the wheel with levels three and four times the limit, and on the unknown number of people who drive under the influence of drugs. The government's consultation document suggests that lowering the limit would result in there being between three and 17 fewer deaths per year. But I'd note that whilst the number of deaths at the present time caused by uh, drink driving is still far too high, there have been, they have been on a downward trend, having halved from 40 in the year 2000 to 20 in 2010, which is testament to the unremitting efforts of Scotland's police forces and their many high-profile campaigns, particularly at festive times, to highlight the dangerous consequences of drink driving. I do think that Richard Simpson made some very interesting points in his speech, and I agree with him that any reduction in the limit will have to be very widely advertised, and as examples of what is done in France, I think has given us serious food for thought. And in this regard, I, I would commend another Grampian campaign, the Safe Drive Stay Alive campaign, which is run regularly by the Fire and Rescue Service and the police with secondary school pupils who are given a graphic presentation of the aftermath of a serious road accident and meet with the survivors of the accident. This doesn't focus particularly on, on alcohol, but it is a significant issue uh, dealt with on those occasions. I may say the, the relatives of, of the victims who did not survive are also present. The, the, at the, it's held in the Beach Ballroom in Aberdeen. There's a spanking new sports car on display outside the Beach Ballroom as the pupils enter. They go through this very emotional presentation. I have seen people, seen teenagers reduced to tears during the presentation. And when they come out, the spanking new car has been replaced by a very seriously damaged wreck. And believe me, it has an impact on the kids. Um, and I think that's a, a fantastic um, campaign. Um, many young drivers, of course, are responsible, like Dennis Robertson's daughter, but others aren't. And I fully agree with him that drivers in the 17 to 35 age group need to be educated on their responsibilities when they get behind the wheel of a car. And I also agree with Stuart Stevenson's comments about the drivers who refuse to acknowledge the risks of drink driving. I, I like John Mason's comments about carrots and sticks and the merits of readily available and cheap public transport to encourage people to leave their cars at home when going out for so a sociable evening involving alcohol. And David Stewart um, made some excellent points about young drivers, and I commend his commitment and his ongoing efforts to educate young drivers as they set out on their driving careers. Presiding officer, the concerns which my colleague Alex Johnson has expressed relate to the question of whether resources will be diverted if the existing limit is reduced, and if the police will be targeting those who are just over a newly reduced limit rather than those who are well over the current limit. People who are three or four times over the current limit would simply become five or six times over a newly reduced limit, and I think we should be targeting these drivers. I reiterate that any form of drinking driving, drink driving is a serious offence, but I'd also suggest that with budgetary constraints, we do need to examine the best use of police resources. And as Alec Johnson has postulated, this may not be to pursue those who are marginally over a reduced limit at the expense of those who are significantly over the current limit. Um, I see I'm beginning to run out of time, <laughs> presiding officer. I don't think I've got time. Um, one related area which has been mentioned by Siobhan McMahon and which I would like to hear more from the Cabinet Secretary about is the issue of people driving under the influence of drugs. I pay tribute to the UK Government for the legislation they brought forth last year to deal with this serious crime and I think it's something we should be looking at seriously. 
In closing, may I say that Scottish Conservatives do welcome this consultation and much of what the Cabinet Secretary and others have said this afternoon, although we do urge them to give full consideration to any possible unintended consequences of lowering the drink drive limits, such as the diversion of police resources away from the pursuit of those flouting the present law. We encourage all interested individuals and organisations to contribute to the debate and to respond to the government's consultation, and we await its outcome with interest. I commend the amendment, Malcolm Johnson. Thank you very much. And I call on Jenny Mara with up to nine minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I very much welcome this debate this afternoon on behalf of the Labour Party. I think we've had um, a very interesting and wide-ranging um, debate. I think it's particularly important as uh, representatives in this Parliament. We all have the, the privilege of representing our constituents and we know from the stories that we hear in our communities that our roads are too dangerous. There are far too many accidents and some of the um, families who have lost loved ones and whose children have been injured on our roads are a stark reminder that we must do everything we possibly can within our power to make our roads safer. And the drink... Stuart Stevenson. Um, I hope you'll not regard me as being unduly picky. I wonder if the member might agree that while there are dangers created by roads, primarily these days the danger is from the users of the roads who are in cars, that the design of roads has improved in a way that the design of drivers has yet to. Jane Lamara. I, I would agree with the member that he is being a little picky. I was making um, a wider point that there are far too many accidents on our roads um, today caused um, by a variety of different factors, as I'm sure he'll agree with me, but it is always, always um, more upsetting and more tragic when these accidents are fuelled by alcohol consumption, and that's why this debate is particularly pertinent this afternoon. I was uh, struck at some moments during this afternoon that perhaps this debate was becoming a bit of a confessional session for some uh, SNP backbenchers who um, informed us of their, uh, of their propensities towards um, drinking and their habits and even perhaps um, reached the uh, stages where I thought we were going to get a student union story from Mark MacDonald, but I'm very glad he saved us all from that. But um, to turn to some of the um, important points made in this debate today, I, I'm very uh, pleased to say that behind me on the, the Labour benches I uh, have especially two colleagues who are very experienced in this area of um, um, alcohol um, expert Richard Simpson and Dave Stewart, who has a very long track record in campaigning on these issues in the Highlands and Islands. And I think it was David Stewart that brought to our attention some of the best practice in this area area um, across Europe. And I think it's worth remembering at the end of this debate this afternoon what these three points were, because he said that the lowest drink driving figures in Europe have three things in common, and that's the legal limit, which we are debating this afternoon, mass media support for enforcement and the high risk of detection. And that high risk of detection, I hope the Cabinet Secretary um, will appreciate me drawing um, his attention to our amendment this afternoon, that we must make sure that our police um, are properly on our streets and not doing civilian jobs to make sure that we can maximise that high risk of detection. Cabinet Secretary. I will not accept that the argument made by ACPOS and made by other serving police officers is that they are on the streets, but what they want is the powers to be able to pull over these hardcore drivers. That is why random testing is so important. Jenny Mara. I think clearly the random testing is, is a debate for another afternoon, if the Cabinet Secretary would like to bring it to the Chamber. But we, um, I think he knows also that we disagree with him on this side of the Chamber, that police officers um, are on the street as much as they can be, and they are in backroom jobs. But I think um, well, I'll come back to that at the end of my closing remarks. I'd like to go back to what my colleague Richard Simpson said, because he made um, a very eloquent speech and drew our attention to some international examples of what happens elsewhere, which I think is very worthwhile to look at um, while we're looking at new um, limits for Scotland. 
And he looked to Australia, where um, the reduction in the, what you can consume in alcohol has actually reduced road fatalities. He also looked to Sweden, where um, drivers get a mandatory, as I understood it, custodial sentence, and gave us a very pertinent, I think interesting, um, example of local um, powers uh, when he talked about um, the local sheriff in Perth when, when, when he was young giving custodial sentences for drink driving and this may be something the cabinet secretary wishes to reflect on too. He also talked and um, drew our attention to the other side of the Atlantic where the, the United States of America maintains their 80 um, uh, milligram limit and also to the Czech Republic and to Hungary that are on the other side of the debate with a zero tolerance approach. And I was convinced by the arguments this afternoon that um, a zero tolerance approach is not the way to go. And I think there was general consensus on that round the chamber. I was also very interested in the points that were made about the 10 milligram limit for some new drivers for three years in some European countries, the idea of this graduated, um, graduated conditions um, when people gain their licence. But I think the point that young drivers have a lower record of drink driving than older people is something that is very um, that the Scottish Parliament, our debate today, should really take note of. And perhaps when we're talking more about mass media interventions and advertising campaigns, we're targeting specifically that older population that seems to have more of a problem with drink driving. David Stewart um, talked very eloquently about his campaign, Sensible Driving, Always Arriving, which he has been running in the Highlands for some years now. And talking about the very sensible approach of targeting drink driving before it starts, the graduated licensing scheme, um, the zero level of alcohol for new drivers, the no passengers um, requirement as well. And he said that the zero, zero tolerance evidence for these new drivers... Yes, Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. The Government fully agrees with David Stewart, and I'll comment on that, about a graduated uh, licence scheme. Given that Northern Ireland is moving towards this, could I ask the Member, if the Government gives an undertaking that we will ask the UK to implement this across the UK, but if they don't, we ask the powers, would you be prepared to support us? Jenny Mara. I think, as I said earlier, President Officer, we'd be very happy to discuss this. Might come from the, the point on come from the point well I think cabinet secretary we discovered earlier that a lot of these powers which you are now saying this afternoon you'd been asking for were not actually put before the Scotland bill committee and perhaps if you'd like to come back to the chamber and clarify that and um, I also feel that some of these measures should be discussed on a UK wide basis. The members now yes. moving into last Stuart Max. I thank the member for taking the intervention. I as a member of that Scotland Bill Committee, can I say that we recommended a, a wide range of powers on drink driving and other matters that should be devolved to this Parliament. We did not, of course, get the support of the Labour Party for those uh, suggestions. Jenny Madden, could you begin to come to a conclusion? Thank you, Presiding Officer. I do not believe the member has been here for the, for the whole debate, so perhaps he will... Uh, you are watching on TV. OK. Well, perhaps I will move to my closing um, remarks. Um, I thought there were some very interesting points made um, by my colleague Siobhan McMahon. What does one drink mean? And I think that is something that we need to address in our advertising campaigns. I think Mark McDonald's point about free drinks, uh, free soft drinks in pubs is a very, very good idea and it's one which um, I have put forward before and I very much support. Um, I think also we, we need to remember the points Siobhan McMahon made about the effect of alcohol on everyone, gender, the body mass, tiredness, how much food has been eaten. And I liked Nanette Milne's point also about the educational campaigns that she has seen working in Aberdeen. I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to seriously consider in his closing remarks our amendment which draws attention to the amount of police on our streets so that this can properly be enforced. But I would support um, the Government's commitment to lowering the level and I would close my remarks there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I now call on Kenny McCaskill to wind up the debate you have until five o'clock, Cabinet Secretary.
Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I say I think this has been, as Jenny Marr, I think, touched upon a remarkably consensual uh, debate in the main, uh, except for the aspects that have been more of the confessional, whether to do with age or drink, but the points she made, some of which that said were said in jest, but many of which I think had a very uh, good point about it. I also think that there were great contributions from around the Chamber. I think many Labour members who spoke to the issue uh, not necessarily uh, to an amendment that has some little relevance to it, uh, made good contributions. Richard Simpson, David Stewart, Siobhan McMahon, uh, all made comments that uh, I fully and heartily agreed with. Equally, James Dornan, Dennis Robertson and others, and indeed, I think Alison McInnes, all made matters that were uh, of uh, sound matters, showing that we do have, I think, a consensus. This is a matter that is an end of a stage of a journey. It was first raised by myself in 2007, and I think tribute was correctly paid by John Mason to Dave Thompson, uh, who has raised this. But I did raise this with the UK Government back in 2007, but five years on, better late than never, we are there. I do believe that it is the right thing to go and to reduce to 50. I think points were made by many others, Richard Simpson in particular, about why we don't go to zero. But there are clear reasons why we should reduce the limit, and this is the answer to the point raised by Alec Johnson. Evidence submitted in 2010 by the British Medical Association to the House of Commons Transport Committee's inquiry into drink and drug, uh, drug driving law indicated that the relative risk of being involved in a road traffic crash for drivers with a reading of 80 uh, milligrams of alcohol and 100 microliters of blood was 10 times higher than for drivers with zero. And the relative crash risk for drivers with a reading of 50 blood was, the level, uh, was twice the level than for drivers with a zero blood alcohol reading. We, by all means, the, I, I fully accept the statistics that he's brought forward, but does he envisage that the enforcement of this lower limit will require additional resources or whether it will result initially in the spreading of existing resources more thinly. No, well, I'll come on to contact right, that. I think that is why the police have actually asked for a rolling of the, lowering of the limit to save lives, but equally for random testing to be able to target. I think these matters join in. I think comment has been made by many across the chamber, by Dennis Robertson and James Dornan and the others in particular, about a change in attitude and culture. And I think all of us of a certain generation, and we all have been making these confessions here, do recall that there was a change. And people have commented on how at one stage I think it was viewed as bad luck if you were caught drinking. It was fairly routine. It wasn't necessarily the norm. It was entirely unacceptable, but it was viewed as perhaps bad luck if you were caught. That message was driven home in the 70s. It was entirely unacceptable because of the deaths and carnage. And I do think that Alec Johnson made a fair point that progress has been made, and I think it was touched upon by Richard Simpson. Nobody denies that actually we are reducing the death and carnage on the road. Progress has been made and things have been better, but there are still two aspects that we will have to address, and I'll come back to that. Equally, I think Stuart Stevenson and others commented on that roads and cars have changed. The uh, vehicles that we possess are now significantly more powerful, even with a uh, much smaller capacity than existed before. Uh, vehicles can be uh, faster in acceleration, and indeed, even I think many of us who have been involved with the police or fire service will know that sometimes matters that have been brought in to improve the safety in vehicles also have what was touched upon unintended consequences in terms of brain injuries, in terms of matters that were built to secure a vehicle to stop it being crushed, actually are where head injuries occur because drivers are plunged forward into aspects that cause significant difficulties. So there have been changes there. So I think we do accept that, as I say, although progress has been made, we do face a hard core. We do also face, I think, different difficulties in terms of, despite the ongoing festive campaigns, and I think I make the point uh, to the Labour member, and I can't remember who it was raised, it is important that we do have these campaigns. It's not for me to direct them. I don't think I have the specific knowledge. It's not for the government to do that. We take the advice of the police. We take the advice of ROSPA. We work with them. We make sure that whether it's at Christmas, whether it's in the summer, whether it's as Nanette Mill makes a point of working with youngsters, sometimes by the fire brigades, sometimes by the police, sometimes by others, we drive that mission home. I can give you an assurance we'll seek to build upon that, and these actions will continue, but they'll be led by those who are the expert uh, on it. But we do face a difficulty with two particular aspects uh, out on the road. One is a hard core, a section of our society who seem to think that the drink-driving laws don't apply to them. 
Doubtless, they probably think many other laws don't apply to them either, and they will seek to ignore the warnings, the consequences. They are prepared to take that chance. I believe that the way to deal with them is to give the police the powers for random testing. That will make sure that they know that the incidence and likelihood of being caught will increase. It was a point made by Richard Simpson regarding the successful progress that had been made in France. It was that likelihood of securing a conviction of being caught. They think the law doesn't apply to them, but they do want to avoid being dealt with by the law. It is on that basis that we have to drive matters forward there. There is also, as I say, the point that was made in guarding young drivers. Dennis Robertson made the correct point. Not only is his daughter uh, doubtless a very uh, sensible driver, the overwhelming majority of young people are sensible not simply in how they drive but how they behave. But there is with them a hardcore minority who flout it, as with the hardcore of their older peers. But equally, I think we are accepting, and it was commented on by Mark MacDonald in terms of stats and other aspects that he might have not been able to provide for the Conservative Party, but he was able to put forward from the Ipsos Mori poll that do show that perhaps, as I say, some of the message that got through to my generation when we were aged between 18 and 24 or 18 and 35 are perhaps needing to be reviewed, reiterated and driven home once again to those of that age group. So we do have to renew those matters with regard to young drivers and indeed with regard to the hardcore. On the question of young drivers, can I say I am open to the point made by David Stewart. I do believe that the graduated matter should be considered with regard to alcohol, and that's a matter that would have to be discussed and consulted upon and we'd come back to this chamber. But equally, as the Government of Northern Ireland moves to take action on graduated licences, not simply with alcohol levels, but indeed what restrictions may be put upon you, when we face difficulties in all areas of this country of young people who are killing themselves and their friends on a regular basis, it is incumbent upon each and every one of us in this chamber to address the tragedies that were articulated by other members in this debate. And I agree with David Stewart. That's why I say to Jenny Mara, I will be asking the UK to consider taking forward the matters that the Northern Irish are going to be dealing with. I will ask the UK to do so. But if they refuse to do so, then I would hope that this chamber would recognise that if it makes sense, if it will save lives, then we must be given the powers to be able to progress with that. But that takes us back to this matter. This is not a constitutional issue. We are progressing with this because this matter has been given to us by the Scotland Act. But let me remind both Lewis MacDonald and Jenny Mara, this was raised initially with the UK Labour government not in terms of giving us the powers, but in terms of them taking action. As with other aspects relating to firearms, we have said if the action, the correct law, is to be implemented, if it can be implemented more quickly by them, if it can be implemented across the UK, that is a good thing, and we will accept it and not stand on ceremony. But if they will not do it, whether on air weapons, whether on drink driving limit, whether on other aspects, be it graduated licences or indeed random breath testing, then it's incumbent upon this chamber as the democratically elected representatives of the Scottish people to be able to act and to have those powers. By all means, Mr MacDonald. Lewis MacDonald. Cabinet Secretary for taking an intervention. Can I take it from what he says that in the discussions he will have with the UK Government around the graduated licence uh, uh, issue and related matters, he will uh, report back to this Parliament on progress he's made with that uh, in order that we can consider those matters further? Oh, absolutely. I, I'm happy to do that. As I say, the same position will take place between myself and Patrick McLaughlin as took place with Labour min ministers. We simply ask that action is taken. If they will take it, fine and dandy, we are happy with that and on we will go. Other matters were raised, and I think Nanette Millen correctly commented on the question of drug driving. That leads on to this. Drug driving is currently reserved. That doesn't, as I say, ultimately, I do wish that these matters are dealt with in this chamber by the elected representatives. But it is important because there is an issue there. Siobhan McMahon raised it and Annette Mill commented on it. There is an issue. I give you an absolute assurance that we will work with the UK government. We have to wait in the research. It's a very complicated matter. It's not simple. How you address it is much more complicated than how you deal with uh, liquor and, and alcohol. And we'll seek to work with them. Excuse me a moment, the Cabinet Secretary. There's a bit too much chat going on. I do think we have, the, have to have the caveat that if, for, if it were to come about that position were, 
was enunciated by those such as the North Commission uh, uh, has done on alcohol, and if action wasn't to be taken south of the border, then we would reserve the right to seek to have the powers here to drive on, because it is a very complicated, very difficult issue. It is something that we have to address. So, as I say, this is about saving lives. It is uh, clearly the matter that something like 30 lives can be saved. Uh, that is nothing that uh, it is not a huge number, but the trauma for the families, and I think Dennis Robertson and others commented on the issues faced by families there where a loved one is lost. These run deep not only within the family, they also run within communities, many in rural areas in Scotland that Alec Johnson himself will be aware of. There are good reasons whereby people in many rural areas have to use a vehicle because of the points correctly made by John Mason about alternative strategies that have to go in com common with the law, because it's not all about enforcement. A lot of it is about education, but we do have to tackle it. That is why, as I say, despite the aspects, or perhaps in addition to the aspects of the confessional that we have had in this debate, I do welcome the fact that there has been a consensus, I think, regarding the fact that we are heading in the right direction. I do believe that the outcome of the consultation will be to disclose that 50 is the correct limit to go. I do believe that if we are to be able to progress matters, that we do have to have additional action taken. It has been declined by the UK Government. We do require the powers, and equally I look forward to discussing matters with Labour and indeed other members as we seek to drive forward this and make Scotland safer. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate on drink driving, and it is now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of three parliamentary bureau motions. And I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 4649 on committee membership, motion number 4650 on substitution on committees, and motion number 4651 also on substitution on committees. Formally moved. Thank you very much. These que the questions on these motions will be put at decision time, to which we now come. There are six questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that amendment 4627.2 in the name of Lewis MacDonald, which seeks to amend motion number 4627 in the name of Kenny McCaskill on drink driving, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed, and therefore there will be a division. We will now move to a vote, and members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 4627.2 in the name of Lewis MacDonald is yes 33, no 64. There were 15 abstentions and the amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 4627.1 in the name of Alex Johnston, which seeks to amend motion 4627 in the name of Kenny McCaskill on drink driving, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed, and therefore uh, we will move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 4627.1 in the name of Alex Johnson is yes 12, no 100. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. 
The next question is at motion 4627 in the name of Kenny McCaskill on drink driving be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. And no, 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 no. I didn't hear a no. I will ask that again. Can I have order in the chamber, please? The question is that motion 4627 in the name of Kenny McCaskill on drink driving be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. Therefore, we will move to a vote and members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 4627 in the name of Kenny McCaskill is yes 100, no 12. There were no abstentions and the motion is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion 4649 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on committee membership be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is agreed. The fifth question is that motion 4650 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on substitution on committees be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament therefore is agreed. And the, next, the sixth question is that motion 4651 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on substitution on committees be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time and I now close this meeting of Parliament.